don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Fight forever and ever and ever and ever. Welcome to the latest edition of the High Spots interview series. We are here with the Big Red Monster Kane. No, we're here with Kevin Steen. Hi, I found this earlier and now I have it in my face. I also found the Junkyard Dog, which I used to own as a child, and Conan. I didn't own him as a child, but look at him. He's all colorful, so. Hi. Uh, First place we want to start with this is uh, talk about your upbringing. Uh, where are you from, and what was your your earliest introduction to wrestling? Uh, I'm from, uh, I was born in Maryville, Quebec, Canada. I was beat as a child. No, that's not true. Uh, I was, uh, you know, I was just a kid, and um, I had great parents that always gave me everything I wanted. So when I wanted to start wrestling, they were behind me 100%, and um, I got into wrestling because my dad rented a tape of WrestleMania, I want to say 11, the one where uh, Lawrence Taylor wrestled Bam Bam Bigelow. And um, after I watched that with him, I, I don't know, I just wanted to be a wrestler, but I was 11 years old, so it wasn't going to happen for a few years. And then uh, I started watching wrestling, and I, you know, my dad started buying the pay-per-views for me and stuff like that. So I got really into it. And then when I was, I want to say, 14, um, I was at school doing anything but what I should have been doing on the computer in computer class and I saw that uh, actually that's not what happened when I was 14 my mom got a contact for a wrestling school Uh, somebody who worked with her knew someone who was running a wrestling school so um, she brought me over there and I was in a barn outside inside of an old ass barn and it was the middle of the summer so it was like you know training for two three hours out in fucking hot weather and just humidity and just crappy a crappy environment and a shitty ring, but the guy who was training us, I honestly don't even remember his name. Um, he used to say that he wrestled for WWF, but, you know, that means he jobbed a macho man in two minutes once, the, you know, that's all he needs to say that he worked for WWF, but he knew enough to train me with, uh, like, the basic stuff. But then a month in, the barn collapsed on the ring. Thankfully, nobody was there, but that was pretty much it for that wrestling school, so um, for a year or so I looked for more wrestling schools in my area, but I just couldn't find any, even though now that I like, now I know that there were plenty back then, but I just didn't find them until eventually I was at school, a computer class, just going on the internet, which was kind of brand new at the time. And then I saw on a wrestling website that Jacques Rougeau, AKA the Mountie, uh, who I'm sure you guys have a action figure of somewhere in here. I'd love to take one home by the way, but that's another story for another time. Uh, he was opening his wrestling school in Montreal, so I told my parents, and they brought me that weekend, and I signed up for his his school, and that's how everything started. What uh, what were your earliest memories as a fan? You talked about seeing WrestleMania 11. Yeah. Like, uh, who stood out to you? Who do you remember noticing? Well, I the first match on that show is British Bulldog and Lex Luger against the Blue Brothers, I believe. British Bulldog was my favorite wrestler instantly. Because he came out looking fucking insanely jacked. And uh, I don't know. I really liked him. And then later on, Shawn Michaels wrestled. Then he became my favorite wrestler. So Bulldog was my favorite wrestler for about an hour and a half, I'd say. And uh, I don't know. Shawn Michaels was just fucking doing stuff that I didn't even know humans could do. Because I was 11 years old. So I was really impressed by the stuff he was doing. And uh, as a kid, believe it or not, I was really small, real short, real skinny. So Shawn Michaels was kind of somebody I could almost relate to. I was like, oh, man, this guy's not that big and he can do this. So maybe I can, too. And it's funny because you talk about memories. But I remember I was a Shawn Michaels fan. And, you know, in wrestling, there were Shawn Michaels fans and Bret Hart fans. And uh, Bret Hart wrestled Bob Backlund in a submission match on that show. And I hated that match. And I was just an 11-year-old kid watching wrestling, and I thought that match was awful. 
So right away I became anti like anti Bret Hart, and I was a Shawn Michaels guy. So that kind of followed me throughout my entire career, really. So yeah. How big a fan were you from that point on? Did you go to live matches? I gotta take this off. It's fucking. Crazy. <laughs> did you Did you go to live matches? Did you buy the magazines? Was it uh, more of a casual thing? Yeah, no, I was like I, I dove into it immediately, and because my you know I didn't obviously have any money of my own. Like if my parents didn't want me to dive into it, they would have kept me from it. But my dad, he saw I liked it, so he uh, he embraced it too. He started buying the pay per views for me, and he um, he brought me like the first time. I remember the date, the first time I saw a live wrestling show was WWF at the, it was actually the Forum back then, it wasn't the Bell Center, it was the old, the old hockey arena uh, where the Canadians used to play, it was J January 12, 1996, I remember the day, uh, Undertaker wrestled Yokozuna, uh, Diesel defended the belt against Bret Hart in a cage match, and I remember it wasn't the main event, and to me that was like, it blew my mind that they weren't last, like I didn't understand why. Undertaker versus Yokozuna was last, but that wasn't for the belt. It didn't make any sense to me. I was such just like a huge wrestling fan. I I went there like I, my parents must have spent two hundred bucks on merch for me. I fucking I had the Shawn Michaels hat, the Shawn Michaels glasses, the Razor Ramon foam hand, and just yeah, I bought the magazines. I bought every pay per view, everything I could get my hands on. I just went nuts from the start, and it was always just WWF like. When WCW came out, I didn't watch WCW. I didn't know anything about ECW until it was almost done. Like done, and I don't know. I was just a huge WWF fan. How influential was Jacques Rougeau to you early on? Um, well, he like when I knew that I was gonna train with him it was a big deal because he in Quebec he was, and in in some ways he still is as far as wrestling is concerned. For people that aren't wrestling fans. Everybody knows what wrestling is, and in Quebec, everybody knows the Rougeau family and him in particular. So uh, back then, and I started training with him in 2000, he had just came, you know, he had pretty good runs in WWF as the Mountie and all that stuff in the Quebecers, and then in 98, he went back to WWE, well, WWF back then with uh, Pierre Carl Ouellette, and they were the Quebecers, and I remember going to house shows and they were that they were on and cheering for them and you know like oh they're from where I am so I have to love them even though really I prefer the New Age Outlaws but no they're they're from this so I have to cheer for them but uh, so when I started training with them it was a big deal I was a little starstruck like I remember when we went to meet him at the wrestling school me and my dad went to the bathroom before we we saw him or anything and as we walked in he was taking a piss. And we, like, we were both taken aback, like, oh, that's Jacques Rougeau, you know? And uh, my dad even says, like, oh, there he is. And he's like, oh, hi, hi. And, like, we didn't even, we weren't even bothered by the fact he didn't wash his hands. We were both just, like, fucking starstruck, like, oh, that was Jacques Rougeau. So getting in the ring with him and, you know, he said, he gave us the speech before the, like, there was a couple people, like, ten guys maybe that wanted to try to train with him. But he's like, oh, I'm not going to take all of you. You have to understand that I have to make sure this is worth my time, all this bullshit. But back then I was eating it happily. Uh, you know, he got in the ring with us, locked up with us, tried to pick us up for a body slam. He's like, oh, hey, you, you know what you're doing. You're going to be good at this. But, you know, he told that to every single person he saw. But back then I was like, oh, my God. Like, I, remember, I went back home. I told my parents. He told me I'd be good. And uh, He was charging, I think, like two grand for three months of training, which I thought, especially back then, was insane. Like, I couldn't expect my parents to pay for that. But they told me they would because... You know, my brother played hockey, and they paid for his hockey, and I wanted to be a wrestler, so they are going to pay for that, and they just told me, do it as good as you can, and if you're going to do it, give it your all. So, uh, you know, it was it was really something to train with them, and for that price, it was also expensive, so it felt like a big deal. It felt like something that was, I don't know, it felt like something that was going to be... Like, when I started training with him, I thought my life was going to change, and the fact that I was training with someone like that, with his experience and his career... That it was going to, for sure, like, there was no way it wouldn't take me places, you know. But I, you know, a couple months in, I figured out that uh, maybe wrestling and him, Jacques Rougeau uh, himself, wasn't all that it's crapped up to be, you know. So. <coughs> Every single time, without fail. Uh, uh, talk about those first few months, your, your I guess, your earliest... Uh, your earliest memories of being on the on the independent scene up there or getting your foot in the door? That's the thing. I wasn't on the independent scene for years because uh, for him, uh, the way he worked is if you train for him, 
he would also run shows, but he would all only run shows maybe once every three months or four months. But he would do them in big buildings, like 3,000-seat arenas. And because he has the name recognition over there and his family has the name recognition in Quebec, he could actually like bring 2,000 people to a show, which uh, in Quebec is not done by anybody except when WWE comes to town. But like the indies over there are lucky if they get 200 people. But I didn't know anything about independent wrestling. I didn't even know of any other wrestling companies that existed. I just, like, I found his wrestling school, and I had heard of his wrestling company because of who he was. And then, um, so what he would do is you would train for him, and when he felt you were ready for a match, he would pick an opponent for you that was part of his wrestling school, and you guys would plan a match together and work at it and practice it move by move. No room for uh, improvisation, no move for... No room for just, you know, going with your gut if something, like, happens. And, like, that's... He wasn't training you that way. He was training to for you to wrestle and know how to do wrestling moves. And then he would decide which wrestling move you're going to do at what time in the match and what the finish was and just every single thing. Like, if you threw a kick when you weren't supposed to throw a kick, you'd hear about it. So it was not the best uh, way to learn how to wrestle, but I didn't know any better, so I just did what he asked me. And once your match was up to his... Um, I don't know, once he liked it enough, then he put you on his shows. So once every four months, you'd get to wrestle in front of 2,000 people, which was really cool, except you were doing a match that you had done literally maybe 100 times already at his wrestling school in front of him and the other trainees. So there was, like, no... There was no real emotion, no, like... So I was wrestling for three years. Like, I did that from 2000 to 2003, just wrestling for him. In those three years, I had 15 matches... And uh, it was always the same match over and over and over. So I really didn't know how to wrestle. And I, I, I knew how to wrestle, but I didn't know how to work, I guess you could say. And then um, I remember one time a buddy showed me a clip on the Internet of a wrestling company in Montreal called IWS. And I was like, holy shit, that looks like so much fun. The, like, the crowd is into it. The wrestlers are interacting with the crowd, which at Rougeau you couldn't do, really, because... He planned the match so that you wouldn't have to even talk to your opponent. He would, you know, you wanted it ingrained in your brain so that there was no way, like, people would see you talking to each other or anything like that. So uh, I saw a clip of IWS. I was like, man, I think I want to do this. And then um, he wouldn't even allow us to go see wrestling shows for independent companies because he didn't want us to be seen or uh, associated with anything else but his product. And uh, once I saw the IWS clip, though, I went to a show, and it was, like, a big deal. Like, I had to hide from, like, people because I didn't want anybody to tell Rougeau I was there. And it turns out all the trainees were doing it anyway. Everybody was going to see those shows. And once I saw it live, that's actually where I saw Generico for the first time and stuff like that. I, I was blown away. Like, there's actually, I remember um, IWS made a highlight reel of the show they had just had. And there's a, a clip of Generico doing the Asahi Moonsault the outside, and you see me lose my fucking mind in the third row, which is kind of funny if you think of where we are now. But uh, So, yeah, that's pretty much how it worked for him. Was there was there a, a bad split with Rougeau? Or yes. Uh, I haven't spoken to him now in nine years, actually. And he, the way Rougeau is as a person is he takes everything somebody will give, give him, like every ounce of energy they have, he'll harvest for himself like his company he would have every trainee doing something for him if his show is a saturday well monday he would call me because he didn't know how to work a computer or anything he's like okay we have to do the music for the show so first match is fucking and it was like a family or like family friendly show so they have silly shit like okay well first match is going to be the clown against like I don't I don't even remember like the gladiator like literally those were the names of the wrestlers okay so now you got to put the music of the clown and then put the music of the gladiator and then the clown wins so you got to put the music of the clown and I'm like well can't the guy just rewind to the he's like no I don't want any mistakes just do it that way so I would do that for him or I would type up the fucking script of the show and he wouldn't like he wouldn't even run his own wrestling school really after a couple months with somebody else running it for him and he did as little as he could to, for, to, like, for his actual shows. He really didn't have anything to do with it besides putting the matches on and deciding who's wrestling who. He would take care of selling the tickets and going to companies and selling them tickets, like, you know, 200 tickets for their employees, and then they'd get, you know, some uh, promotional stuff on the show. And But, like, the actual legwork would be all done by his trainees and whoever he managed to talk into helping him out. And... Um, so uh, 
I used to do that a lot, and I used to, like, I used to almost feel like the promotion was mine a little bit. So when it came time to wrestling elsewhere, because I wanted to, like, I felt like I was never going to learn if I was wrestling three times a year, even if it was in front of 2,000 people. And the other little companies that I was now aware of, like IWS and there was other companies like MWF and just the companies around my area, even though they drew 100 people, like those, the guy, first of all, those guys seemed to have a lot of fun doing what they did. And at Rougeau, having fun wasn't exactly a priority because you had to do your match the way it was planned and you couldn't derive from the plan. And it was just, it, you know, it was not real. It was no emotion. There was no... Um, so when it was time for me to ask him to go wrestle those places, um, it was hard because I figured that he would tell me, well, you can either quit and go wrestle there or stay with me and just not wrestle anywhere else. So, but I felt, you know, because of all the work I'd put into his shows and the company itself, I felt like the company was almost like mine in a way. So, um, uh, when I asked him about it, I was surprised because he said, yes, it was fine. We could wrestle anywhere else because it turns out that he had just heard that he might have cancer. So he wasn't going to run shows for a while. So he allowed us to go wrestle wherever we wanted. Um, so like, the Rujo, I remember it was in 2003, and back on the independent scene in Quebec, it was almost like the Rujo, like Rujo students invasion. Like 12 of us just took over every single show we could. Like every show now had 12 Rujo students on them because we were begging to be put on the shows. And while even if he wasn't really training us, the guy who was training us was really good. So we were all pretty decent at what we did. So the promoters wanted to use us. So, uh, you know, there was a whole bunch of us. And I kind of stood out of the group because from the start, Rujo kind of pinned me as his, um, I don't know, his poster boy a little bit because I used to do a 450 splash and he had never, ever seen that. Like he lost his mind when he saw me do a 450. He had never seen that before. So uh, people knew me. So when I started wrestling and asking to wrestle in like other promotions around where I'm, like, I live, they were all more than happy to book me. And then a couple months later, I start, like I wrestled the IWS, and that was, for me, the, the best time I've ever had in wrestling at that point. Like, it was such a blast to wrestle in front of fans that wanted to see wrestling. It wasn't just a bunch of kids or, uh, you know, a bunch of people that worked at companies that gave them tickets to go see the show that Rujo was having that had, knew nothing about wrestling. Like, these fans wanted to see wrestling. They were rowdy. They were fun. And when they like something, they let you know. They bang on the ring. They're all insane. That was such a great experience. And I was wrestling guys that had as much passion for wrestling as I did like Generico and Beef Wellington and those guys from IWS so it was really something and then he told us three months later that we couldn't wrestle anywhere else anymore because he was going to start running again and because he had finally after years of telling us that this was going to happen had managed to secure a dark match when WWE came to town for two of his students and, uh, you know, for three years, he kind of dangled that carrot in front of us. We're like, oh, I'm the only guy in Quebec who has connections to WWE. And it was kind of true. So uh, even though we wish we could wrestle elsewhere or more often, there was always that little, you know, oh, well, what if he manages to get a tryout in WWE? Because back then, I didn't know any better. I had no clue how it worked. I didn't know anybody that worked in WWE. And I was just a dumbass that thought, well, if he gets a, a tryout, I'm going to get a tryout. And for sure, they'll like me. I was insane, but whatever. Um, so then eventually he told us, okay, they're coming in, I don't know, they're coming in early next year, Ross coming, and I got a dark match for two of my students. And it's going to be you and this other guy, Eric. So you have to stop wrestling anywhere else. And now you have to, he wanted me to sign a contract with him for like five years in case WWE wanted to sign me and he would get like 30% or some fucking insane percentage of what I would make. And um, that wasn't even the part that bothered me. I didn't really care about any of this. Of course, I would have liked to have that dark match, but I didn't want to stop wrestling for IWS in particular and the other companies either. But IWS was really like, I had so much fun there that I felt those, those shows were the first time I actually felt like I was a wrestler. So uh, it took me two weeks to decide and finally I made up my mind. I told him I didn't want to stop wrestling, but I wanted the dark match. So please just let me do both. And he told me no way, and he hung up on me, and that was it. I haven't talked to him since. Actually, I sent him an email last year, because he was, or two years ago, because he was doing a benefit show for autism, which is something that's really close to my heart. And I told him, listen, I know we haven't spoken in a while, but I'd like to do that show for you, just because I want to do my part. And he wrote me, no thanks. And that was it. So there's definitely hard feelings there, I'd say. 
I uh, definitely want to get into IWS and, and the people that you met there and your yeah. experiences there. And I guess maybe the, the place to start would be, do you remember meeting El Generico? Yeah. I, uh, I remember seeing him wrestle, but before I saw him wrestle, or it was it after, I don't even know. But at some point, he came to a Rougeau show with uh, Beef Wellington and Kid Kamikaze, or two guys that they wrestled for Zog, they trained there, and they left way like way before I even considered leaving. They left cuz they weren't happy with him cuz thing about Rujo is a huge asshole. Like he's not a good person. He's really not. And I could give a lot of examples of why, but um he's just not a good guy. So they left. They couldn't get along with him and they wanted to wrestle more and then IWS, you know, that they liked it. They wanted to try it and they they were the first ones from the Rujo clan to to get a shot there and they did good. So uh and, you know, they became friends with a bunch of IWS guys, including Generico, and they brought him to a show, and I met him after a Rougeau show there the first time, and I immediately thought he was he mentally, you know, like something wasn't right with this guy, just from the way he was acting, and just, he was fucking nuts. But yeah, that was my first meeting with him, and then I saw him wrestle at IWS a couple times. Talk about your early experiences at IWS. The first few shows, you said it was the most fun you'd had, and the most yeah. you felt like a wrestler. Yeah, the first show I did... I remember uh, because I was going to do that show, like, th now they knew that I was going to be able to, like, th the news kind of broke up that, oh, the Rougeau guys are now allowed to do shows. So IWS immediately, they had uh, their biggest show of the year would take place at the Medley, which was a big, like, huge bar downtown Montreal. And that would always draw, like, I don't know, maybe seven, eight hundred people. And um, they would have smaller shows every month at the, the Scratch, which was a smaller bar, but they would draw, like, two, three hundred people. But crowd was always fucking crazy and it was packed they couldn't hold more than 200 people anyway so as soon as they heard that i was going to be able to wrestle for them they announced that i was going to wrestle this guy excess who some people might know he did a couple of shots in the states on uh, various indies because at that point he was considered the best wrestler in quebec like people people thought this guy was one of the best wrestlers in the world like for you know like the closed off quebec wrestling scene Excess was like one of the best guys in the world. Literally, people thought he could go with anybody in the world, which is really laughable when you think about it. But because of how closed off Quebec wrestling was to the rest of the world, uh, that's how people thought. So they booked me against him because I had the most hype coming out of Rougeau's school. So it was like two months before the actual show, but they announced that September 20th is going to be Excess versus Kevin Steen. Jacques Rougeau's like, you know, top student. And then they made me come in for the show the month before to just to do a promo and just doing that promo which i never done i never did promos on Rujo's shows i never talked on the mic or anything this is my first time ever i felt very comfortable just because of the crowd like the crowd made me feel like i belong there and um it was really special and then excess came out and i put a beat down on them and it was just it was real emotion i had never felt that at a wrestling show before while i was in the ring Everything else like from Rougeau's shows was fabricated, kind of. Just, like, almost, you know, I remember reading about guys that would work WCW TV tapings where it'd say applause and boo and shit like that in the crowd. Like, not, not one emotion was real when you'd wrestle Jacques Rougeau. Like, there was no sign saying applause or boo, but there might as well have been, you know. It was so clear-cut, like, the clown's the baby face and the gladiator is the bad guy and the kids. And, you know, it's just not real. It wasn't real wrestling fans, and IWS was... And it was just so refreshing. And then uh, I wrestled Excess on that big show, and we had, a, I think, a really good match, and people really liked it. And I think it opened a lot of people's eyes to me. Like, some people knew of me but had never seen me wrestle because Rougeau's shows weren't exactly popular to actual wrestling fans. He would, draw, like, he would draw 2,000 casual fans or whatever, people that just walked off the street or got handed tickets. But as far as real wrestling fans in, in Quebec, nobody would go see Rougeau's shows because they thought they were boring and... You know, family friendly is not exactly something that's cool to take your friends to, but IWS was so uh, that was like something. And also the opponents I was wrestling, like Excess, he might not have been one of the best guys in the world, but he was good and he knew what he was doing and he really loved wrestling. And then the next month after that, they put me in a three way with Pierre Carl Ouellette and El Generico, which was my first match against them, and we tore the fucking roof off the crowd that to this day is still the cra one of the craziest crowd reactions I've ever gotten anywhere was for that match and it wasn't just one moment it was the whole time people were just insane and there was like nothing that could come close to it at that time of just having a blast in the ring and IWS was really good for that for a long time as probably having the best crowds I had ever uh, wrestled in front of you know for a long time until it 
started kind of going down the drain, but that's another story. Did you have much of a relationship with uh, Pierre Carlo Led, or just yeah. kind of saw him here and there? Uh, no, I did. He kind of became, um, I guess, my mentor for a while. You know, uh, I met him at Rougeau's. Him and Jacques had a falling out when they were partners, and then he wasn't around for a long time. But eventually, I don't know, Jacques kind of. What I think what happened is Jacques was brought in by WCW to be a special referee for a match between Lance Storm and Mike Awesome on a Canadian pay per view. And they wanted Carl there as well. Uh, so Jacques had kind of no choice but to, you know, do it, like to get along with Carl. And then I guess they patched things up, whatever was wrong between them. So PCO uh, started coming around to the wrestling school and. You know, he could see who had heart and who had, like, desire and wanted to be a wrestler. And I think he he saw that in me and he took me under his wing a little bit. And then eventually we both left because we just couldn't take Jacques anymore. And we both ended up in IWS. So, uh, yeah, we definitely had a really good relationship. I don't really talk to him anymore. Just he kind of fell off the face of the earth. But for a while there... I'd probably say he was one of my best friends and just definitely somebody that helped me a lot in wrestling. Maybe not necessarily in uh, sending me places, but teaching me about wrestling and how what I was missing from Jacques, which is, you know, instead of just doing wrestling matches that I knew, you know, like by heart, just to learn how to work and how to, you know, feel a crowd and stuff like that. He was definitely the one that introduced me to that concept and helped me out a little bit. So, so tell us... Uh from this point, tell us a little bit about your story. You're in IWS. Yeah. You're having fun. Do you remember, like, the first call from CZW, your first booking yeah. in the States? Like, yeah. kind of tell us how all that came about while you're still in IWS. Yeah, um, I did IWS for a while um, from 2003 to, like, 2004, every show from September 2003 to, I don't know, maybe October 2004. And then what happened is... Um, uh, this guy, Lacor, his real name is Michael Ryan, would write IWS press releases, and he would, like, put a lot of effort into those write-ups. And he, like, I knew nothing of the indies in the States, and I, I, I didn't follow independent wrestling. Like, I knew of Ring of Honor, and I knew of CZW, and I knew of, uh, like, Jersey All Pro, only because, uh, like, those guys, Beef Wellington and Kid Kamikaze, who were my friends, would, would you know, watch it and would follow it, and they, they knew of all that stuff, and... Sometimes they'd send me links to, like, oh, check this out, and it would be a highlight video from CZW with the Briscoes against two dudes and just doing crazy shit and Amazing Red and Ruckus. And I'm like, oh, man, these guys are amazing, you know? Like, I'd never seen any of that stuff before. I was not introduced to independent wrestling for years. Uh, but Lacor was kept up with all that stuff, and he, you know, he had all these contacts with, you know, people in the States that were involved in wrestling somehow. And I guess he was... Um, he would get on Jersey All Pro a lot about using us, which honestly I had never even thought of a, the possibility of me going to wrestle in the states at that point. Like I was just happy doing stuff at IWS, and uh, you know there was a, f a company I wrestled for in Quebec City that uh, would bring in like they brought in Chris Daniels in 2004, and uh, that was a huge deal. Uh, I know it seems silly now, like if you're listening to this and you think, well, yeah, they brought a wrestler, you know, why is that a big deal? But Back then, nobody had ever brought in, like, an independent wrestler. But, you know, Daniels had kind of a name. He had done some stuff for TNA. He had done stuff for Ring of Honor. Like, it was a big deal. And they brought him in. And I remember people literally, like, were saying, oh, he's not going to show up. It's not true. It was like, it was almost like, <laughs> like, it felt like they were bringing in The Rock almost. You know, it was like, the people wouldn't believe that he was going to show up. And then they bought him his flight, and he showed up. I picked him up at the airport, and they chose me to wrestle him. And uh, I remember we sold out the building. It was 500 fans, and it was, uh, like, the craziest match. Like, we had just a regular good match, but the crowd is insane the whole time. For 30 minutes, they that's dueling chants. Like, it, it felt... Now, you know, it's a regular thing on TNA where fans will just fucking chant nonstop for no reason. But back then, like, in Quebec City where it took place, and, like, that had never happened. Like, it was un, unheard of. Like, I remember coming out of that match, and even Daniels at that point was like, Jesus, they were so fucking hot. It was crazy. They, like, anything you did, like a punch would get this insane pop. Don't give up. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. 
Don't give up. Fight forever. Fight forever and ever and ever and ever. So uh, like that was a really big deal. So for me, wrestling in Quebec and IWS, and then you know if there were like if companies were gonna start bringing U.S. guys in, like they would always put them against me. I wrestled Joe and I wrestled Carino and guys like that. I was fine with doing that, and I figured somehow that path would lead me to eventually advance in wrestling and go somewhere. But I never occurred to me that, like, oh, maybe I should send tapes to promotions in the states and try to go somewhere. But Lacor. Michael Ryan ended up uh, getting in contact with Jay Jersey All Pro, and finally they uh, they said, "Okay, we'll book some of the IWS guys." Because what happened is uh, CZW needed guys for their tournament of death that summer, in 2004, and they IWS was a hardcore fed. I didn't do any hardcore, but like guys like Sexy Eddie in the Arsenal would do them. So they brought those guys in, and um, Eddie, uh, I'm sure you've all seen the footage. Eddie got cut in his arm. And it like it, it touched an artery or something, and he like he squeezed his arm at one point, and the blood just flew out of his arm like a fountain, and he drank it, and it was just such a crazy visual because if you look in his eyes, you, like you see this guy's lost his fucking mind, and it you know that could have killed him like he was his artery was fucking he was bleeding out, but he didn't give a shit he was just all there for the show, and that like made IWS must see for a lot of. U.S. fans, and I think that's what pushed Jersey All Pro to be like, well, I guess we should take a look at some of these guys. So Jersey All Pro booked us first for a show in September, uh, booked four of us, me, Excess, Beef Wellington, and Generico, and I think maybe Eddie as well. But then CZW, because of what had happened with Eddie, decided to bring more IWS guys in, and uh, they booked us after Jersey All Pro did, but their show was before the Jersey All Pro show. So we made our debut uh, in CZW. My first match in the States was that IWS four-way on the CCW show in September of 04. So um, that's how it all started in the U.S. Indies. And I met some people, and we got a name for ourselves because of that match, and things kind of just snowballed from there. Was it jarring being on the U.S. Indies? Was it a totally different experience than Montreal? Um, it was really nerve-wracking because we... Like, for me especially, because the other guys were kind of aware of what, you know, CZW was and Ring of Honor and Jersey Opera and the U.S. Indies scene. I had no clue. The only wrestling I watched was WWF. So it was really nerve-wracking. And, uh, again, now it's kind of funny if you think about it. But to us, this was gigantic. Like, holy shit, we're wrestling in CZW. And, like I said, like, you know, those guys would send me clips of some stuff going on and I would watch it. And it was always, like, CZW... For some reason, there was a German website that had a bunch of CZW clips on it back in the day, and I would watch all those clips, and I'd be amazed at some of the shit I would see there because I'd never seen anything like that in wrestling. So we were going to wrestle then. It was really nerve-wracking, and it was a four-way, and we were on the night show, and I remember it was a double shot. And back then, CZW had a lot more hype than it has now. You know, It's kind of died down now. Nobody really goes out of their way to watch CZW. Uh, sorry, but it's true. Uh, but back then, people would. And then um, we were on the night show, and on the afternoon show they were running, there was another four-way, and it was the SoCal four-way with Super Dragon, Bobby Quantz, B-Boy, and Excalibur. And I didn't know any of those guys. I had heard of them, but I had never seen them wrestle. I didn't know anything about them. And uh, a couple of my friends had told me, for example, like, oh, well, you know, look out for Super Dragon. He's a real piece of shit, this one. Like, he has a bad attitude. He's got a bad reputation. And, you know, if you guys have a better match than them, whatever... So there was all this weird, you know, it was a weird feel to going there. And it was also like we were walking in four guys in a CZW locker room. Like everybody knows each other. We don't know anybody. It was just a strange feel. And uh, there was a lot of pressure. And then we, they had that four-way in the afternoon and we watched it and it was really good. And we were all like, fuck, how are we going to top that? Because we knew we'd get compared to it. So we decided to do every single fucking move we knew in the span of 15 minutes. And if you go back and watch that match, a lot of people, like we've taken a lot of criticism from other wrestlers for that match, but the way the crowd reacted, it was the perfect fucking match for us to be introduced to people. Like that made us 
in in the states like if we had had a more toned down match so that we wouldn't piss anybody off and nobody would complain that it was just a fucking spot fest i probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now that's what i think that's how important i think that match was did you meet super dragon that night yes what were he your first completely blew us off what were your first impressions of him i don't know he was with his girlfriend and excalibur was with his girlfriend and they were walking out of the parking lot as we were coming in, and they had just had their match, and we were like, hey, really good match, guys. And like, oh, okay. And he just walked away, and he didn't want to talk to us. He didn't want any interaction with us. So we were like, oh, maybe he is a fucking dick. But then a week later in Jersey All-Pro, he wrestled Beef Wellington. And uh, Generico being Generico, kind of just he kept talking to him all night. Because Beef Wellington was Generico's buddy, and Beef Wellington was wrestling Super Dragons, so he kind of hovered around them the whole time. And I think he started—I don't know—he opened like he opened himself up to us a little bit more, and he kind of let us in. But I think at, at that CZW show, he had no interest in knowing any of us. And he later admitted that he was actually not—you know—the first time we encountered him, when we said hi, and he kind of blew us off because we hadn't had the match yet. But when we had that the four-way that night, he was also on the CZW show that night. He saw our four-way and he was mad because it was better than theirs, and he didn't like it. He like didn't he didn't like us. But then a week later, he kind of warmed up to us when he just spent some time with us, and that's how we that's how we met, and everything kind of snowballed into us going to PWG. Tell me about the snowball. Tell me about CCW uh, well, to I'll, PWG. I have to, to give credit to El Generico actually, which I don't like doing much of, but uh, yeah, he uh, he kind of. Not really became buddies with Super Dragon, but he talked to, like, you know, he talked with him that night at Jersey All Pro, and I didn't really talk to him. But um, I think even at that point after the CZW four way that was that happened a week earlier, I think people could already see that Generico and I were kind of the standouts from the crew. Like they liked they liked Eddie, they liked Beef, they liked Excess, but I think they knew me and Generico were probably the guys that were going to stand out the most. And then. Um, we had the show in Jersey All Pro, and kind of same thing. Generico really shined in the match he was in, and I did as well. So, I guess uh, throughout the week, Generico was talking to Super Dragon online on AIM, whatever, and uh, AOL, and I don't know. They were talking about uh, PWG, and again, I knew nothing of PWG. I had heard about it only because Beef Wellington and Kid Kamikaze would talk about it, how like it was a fed with like kind of funny show names, you know, and they really hoped that they'd wrestle there one day if if things went well in CZW and Jersey All Pro because they really liked it. But I had no idea what it was. I knew it was in California, and I knew Super Dragon and Excalibur were part owners, but I didn't know anything else about it. And then Generico was already trying to hustle and get himself booked anywhere he could go. But to me, even then, after CZW and Jersey All Pro, it hadn't even crossed my mind. I was fine doing just whatever I was going to do. If CZW wanted to bring me back, I'd go back and then... I was thinking things were going to snowball, and they did, but also Generico kind of pushed the door open by, uh, I don't know, he was talking with Super Dragon, and he joked about how he'd love to go to PWG, and Super Dragon kind of laughed at him, because back then, paying for flights for us, even though we had we had just had two good matches in the States, like, we really weren't draws or anything, and I guess Generico said, well, we'll wrestle for free, and I guess that was good enough for Dragon, he's like, oh, really? And then Generico called me, he's like, do you want to go to PWG? And I think it was... November? I'm like, yeah, I do. And back then, the flights weren't what they are now. It was like 350 or 400 bucks, and he paid for our flights. He sent us our flight info, and we were both pretty fucking bewildered. Like, I remember we were driving to the airport. I was driving, and he was in my car, and we were both like, holy shit, he's paying for us to go to California on a plane. That's insane. Like, we were out of our fucking minds excited. And then uh, we got to PWG, and he and Excalibur had to leave midway through the show because they had to catch a red eye to go to CZW, which was having a show the next day. So, And we were supposed to wrestle um, Scorpio Sky and Quicksilver. But um, they kind of just didn't show up. They, they said they were stuck in traffic. But I don't know if that's true to this day because I remember in the week leading up to the show, they had announced me and Generico against Quicksilver and Scorpio Sky. And I, again, I didn't know anything about those guys. I had never seen them wrestle. But I googled maybe Scorpio Sky, and I saw an interview we had done for some West Side where he was complaining about how PWG, like PWG, would bring guys from the outside and kind of showcase them more than they would showcase their own local talent. So that night when he didn't show up because of traffic, in my head I was like, maybe he just doesn't want to wrestle us, you know, because we're guys coming in from the outside again. 
And it turns out it turned out that uh, they gave us a choice. You either wait till they show up and plan a match real quick and do the best you can, or you guys can wrestle each other. And at that point, I didn't want to fucking wrestle guys I didn't know and who, as far as Sky was concerned, didn't seem to really want to work with guys from the outside anyway because I wanted to do really good and hopefully get to come back, which was far-fetched because of the flight issues and all that stuff. We didn't think that, you know, there's, there's no way they're going to pay a, a flight for us to come every month. But we, were, we just wanted to do as good as we could. So we decided to wrestle each other, and uh, Dragon left before our match and told us, well, just do what you can and just fucking steal the show. And we we're like, oh, well, thanks, you know? Like, he just, he won the belt on that show against Frankie Kazarian in, like, a really crazy match. Oh, no, Conan fell. And, uh, the sh- like, the main event was Scott Loss against, like, Brian Danielson. And we were like, oh, steal the show. That's nice. And it also had Jack Evans versus Chris Daniels right before us. Like, you know, it was fucking nerve-wracking. That was the match before us. The match after us was Brian Danielson. We were sandwiched between these two matches. But we went out there and did the best we could. And it turns out, to this day, we had what... Dragon calls one of his favorite matches in PWG history, and people loved it. And they were fuck. It was the cl- at that point it was even better than what IWS fans had for us. Like it was just such a blast, and it's a highlight of my career to this day. Still, the reaction the fans gave us, and the post match reaction, and just the way people reacted to us. So it was really uh, it was really special. And we left, and then the next day, Dragon was like, "Okay, well, are you free for next month?" And that was it. It's, the rest is history. We've been there every month ever since. So. At this point, do do other people start calling, or does that take a while? I CZW was booking us regularly, and Jersey All Pro as well. And then, uh, yeah, I would I wouldn't say any people started calling. We decided that we wanted to go to Ring of Honor next. Like that seemed like the next logical step. So uh, in in November, actually we went. I remember we went even before we had the actual PWG match. We were booked for November in PWG, and uh, in early November we went to a Ring of Honor show. Me, Beef Wellington, and Generico, just to give uh, with our tapes. It was the show was in Boston, and we went there, and uh, we had met some of the guys on the like you know we had met Punk and Cabana and Joe and some of those guys through various indies like a jersey all pro for example a couple months before or joe had already come in to wrestle me in montreal so like those guys knew of us so when we went there uh we watched the show and then we asked after the show we asked punk like hey so we have a tape you think it, we should give it to anybody he's like yeah go give it to gabe over there we're like who's gabe he's like he's he runs the company okay so we went up to gabe and we gave him our tapes and it's like, yeah, I heard of us. I've never seen you guys, but I, I heard of you. Uh, I'll watch these and I'll get back to you. And that was it. And then it took a good three months. Like after the PWG hype kind of started where like people were talking about what Generico and I were doing over there, Gabe called and uh, asked, um, he asked me to be weapon of mass destruction against Jay Lethal in a final battle 2004. So I guess it wasn't a couple months before he called. I'm getting my time frame mixed up but he called a couple weeks later i guess and yeah he asked me to do that and i was gonna do it but then i got injured so generico did it and that was like our first our first uh, experience with ring of honor and then he booked us for a show in february like a do a die do our die card and he gave us a couple dates throughout the year 2005 from like february to august so uh uh that happened but we you know at that point we were regulars in pwg we were regulars in CZW, and we were regulars in Jersey All Pro, so we were getting plenty of work, and we had IWS still and stuff like that, but we actually had to start cutting cutting back on IWS because of, you know, we go to the States instead. And uh, that actually created a bit of hard feelings with IWS, and especially Beef Welling, because he was the booker at the time, and we were friends with him. And I think he was also really jealous that he didn't get to go to PWG, and we did. But, uh, yeah, so... Like, our bookings in PWG and CZW didn't necessarily help us get more bookings, but I'm sure it helped uh, help for Gabe to notice us, you know? So we got a bit, a couple Ring of Honor shots out of it, but it didn't go anywhere that first time, and that's about it. We just kept doing PWG, and that's really what helped us. Like, I think Generico would say the same as PWG was, um, like, it, it catapulted us to, like, new heights. Like, I went to Japan because of PWG, Generico too, same thing, and 
um, then Japan led for me to go back to Ring of Honor. So I think uh, it's weird. You know, the snowball, it really started with IWS and then CZW and then PWG and then everything else. But I would say PWG is probably the, the place that helped us the most by far to break out. Talk a little bit about PWG, and it's kind of an interesting, for people that don't know, it's kind of an interesting uh, infrastructure, how it's run, and, and the it really is like a big communal kind of thing. It used to be. It's kind of not anymore, though. Like, um, when I first started there, there were six owners, and all of them wrestled, and all of them cared a lot, and Super Dragon did more than any of them, because he kind of had more knowledge of the stuff that they was needed to run the company but like like he had experience in dvd editing and stuff like that and excalibur would write the write-ups and do the covers for the dvd and stuff like that like the other four dudes didn't really do anything besides put money into the company when it originally started um but it you know it was run by a bunch of guys that really loved wrestling and they really loved each other too like it was a big family it was a lot of fun i I have so many fond memories of going there and like we'd go Generico and I would get there two, three days early just to hang out with those guys, and we'd go to Top Gun Tall World's house because he has a huge house, and his parents would live upstairs and let us. We'd have the whole basement. It was like a house of its own, the basement, and just I don't know, ten, twelve guys like Bosch and Quicksilver and uh, Sky and Ronan and me, Generico. All those dudes would just hang out, like, and whoever would fly in, you know, like Hero, Claudio, all those guys. We would just all hang out all night, watch wrestling, just have fun and then the show would happen and that was even more fun so it was a really uh unique feel and um i don't know i think that whole uh that whole aura helped to make the show something special too because i think if i've said this before pwg if it was a person it'd be like your best friend like as a company there's not like there's nothing better and there's nothing more comforting than pwg it's 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 a little bit weird to say but it's true like and i think the fact that everybody was so uh close with each other i think that's what helped a lot in creating that that you know that feel for pwg and uh, now it's not run so much like that anymore there's only excalibur and uh, super dragon and joey ryan left of the original owners and uh i mean joey helps out but the you know most of the workload is on super dragon and excalibur but uh I don't know, Bosch and, and uh, not Bosch, but uh, Scott Loss and uh, Top Gun and those guys just decided, and Disco Machine just didn't really want to do it anymore uh, for various reasons. So losing them was actually kind of shitty because we were really good friends with all those guys and the family kind of split apart. And then it's, it's a bit of a different feel outside of the ring now for PWG. Like I don't go there for weeks at a time anymore just to hang out. But it's still, uh, when the show starts, it's still the best company and the most fun company around for sure. So now you're you're established in PWG. You're in PWG all the time. Was Ring of Honor still a goal, or were, um, you, were you happy? Were you content where you were? I think eventually, it, I really want to wrestle for Ring of Honor. But that first little run, Generico and I, um, it just didn't click. You know, uh, we did like six matches in 2005, and it just didn't work. I don't know why. But it didn't work like it worked anywhere else. And uh, I don't think Gabe wanted to use us. And I don't think that we really knew how to... Uh, how to wrestle there in a way that would uh, allow us to just be... Like, needed for that company. I don't know how to put it. Just... How to market yourself. Kind of. Like, we didn't, you know... I Like, I remember asking Gabe, like, do you want me to work more heel or baby face? And he's like, ah, oh, it just doesn't matter. Just wrestle. That doesn't really work for me, I found out. Like, just wrestling is not something... Like, nobody's dying to see Kevin Steen just wrestle, you know? Uh, and so that's what I tried doing, and it didn't work out. And for Generico, it didn't work out for whatever reason either. And then, but we, you know, we still had PWG, and we still had all of those other companies. And then um, we started going overseas. Like, I went to Dragon Gate, and Generico followed, like, uh, you know, a little bit later, but when I was uh, over in Dragon Gate, like, before I went to Dragon Gate, when they did CCW for Ring of Honor, I gave it my last step to try to go to Ring of Honor. I, I was CCW Iron Man champion at the time, and I hated CCW. It was awful. I didn't like wrestling there. The fans were terrible. And I, I used to be angry at the fans, but I later realized why wouldn't they be terrible when the product they were given was so shitty. Like, 
and it wasn't really the wrestling it was just the way it was presented and just you know like Zandig owned the company at that point and he didn't even give a fuck about what was going on in his ring so why would the fans give a fuck about it but I used to be mad at the fans or whatever and just think oh these fucking fans don't give a shit so why would I care and I don't give a fuck about this company either because the owner doesn't give a fuck about this company so I would go there to get money and you know, be with my friends and wrestle, and I still like the people that were in CZW, like the other wrestlers, so it was always a good time to go. But while they were doing that angle, I remember they brought in Super Dragon as part of the CZW crew with Hero and Necro, and I was like, man, I could be, you know, maybe I could be part of that. And then I realized I don't even want to fucking be CZW. And then I realized, man, maybe I could just be the one CZW wrestler that fucking wants to be in Ring of Honor. So I pitched that idea to Gabe, and he didn't give a shit. He didn't care. Like, we, we were still friends with Colt. Like, we were friends with Colt. We were friends with Colt already, and he was part of that whole angle. And I pitched that idea to Colt, and he's like, well, it's better than not doing anything. So, yeah, pitch it to Gabe. Because I guess Colt was, you know, still telling Gabe, like, you, can, you should use Steen and Generico. And Gabe's like, eh, when it's right, it's just not right, and whatever, whatever bullshit I, excuses he had not to use us. And I pitched that to Gabe, and he's like, oh... Yeah, it's not a bad idea, but that's not really the way we're going to go. But if you want to use it in CZW to, you know, for your own thing, do it. You know, it's not going to hurt us. So I said, okay, fine. So I started going on CZW shows and cutting promos how I, I was begging Ring of Honor to take me back. I didn't give a shit about this belt. I'll throw it in the garbage. I'll piss on it, whatever you need me to do. Please hire me back. And I was just doing that to, you know, get reaction at CZW and just be entertaining but I was, I was hoping that eventually Gabe would be like, okay, we'll use you, you know? And he didn't. But, like I said, it didn't drive me crazy. It just seemed to me like Ring of Honor was the next logical step. But then Dragon Gate and PWG kind of developed a little relationship. And, uh, like, Chris Bosch went over there for, to do Wrestle Jam. And then Sima came to Bola. And uh, <clears throat> after Bosch went, I'm like, well, I'm going to send a tape to Dragon Gate. And I did. And they watched it, and I guess they liked what they saw because they emailed me and asked me to go for two months. And I said yes, and then Sima came to Bola, and I wrestled him, and it went really well. So, you know, they were real happy that I was going to go there, and they planned, like, a pretty good push for me, and I was going to be, like, kind of a monster heel because I, I was bigger than the guys they had over there, and they were going to put me in the top heel faction, which they did. And uh, Generico wrestled Sima and Bola, too, and they had, like, a really good match at, I'm sure a lot of people remember it was probably one of the best matches that year anywhere. And Seema loved it, and he went back and told the office, like, oh, my best match in the States, Generico, very good, very good. So, you know, they brought Generico in later after me. But while I was in Japan doing that for those two months, uh, I guess Gabe decided to give Generico another shot. And uh, Generico did a show in November, and then he did Final Battle, and I didn't. I was in Japan, but then when I came back, Gabe didn't show any interest in using me and I was like fuck this kind of sucks like I want to wrestle if Generico was going to be there I want to be there too and then finally uh, Gabe emailed me and said okay well you and Generico against the Briscoes in Philly it doesn't mean anything it's just one match I need a partner for Generico and I need opponents for the Briscoes so don't you know he told me like don't get your hopes up or anything so I, I don't know if he assumed I was going to fuck it up I don't know he did, certainly didn't have any faith in me but I guess he told me later that he had seen some of the footage from me in Dragon Gate and thought like, oh, well, I think Steen has something I can use now. But he didn't want to, I don't know, give me give me hope, I guess. So I went there, and um, when we got there, he told us, you guys can do whatever you want, and you have 20 minutes. In 2005, when we go there, he would tell us, you know, your third match, don't go crazy, this and that. Don't burn out the crowd. You have 10 minutes, and... They didn't put us in a situation to fucking steal a show in 2005. And I don't know if they had that we would have. I think we would like I think we would have done good because we did in CZW and we did in PWG. So we probably would have done good in Ring of Honor. But they hadn't booked us that way. And then in 2007, that first match against the Briscoes and also the opponents we had. You know, the fucking Briscoes are amazing. He gave us uh, complete you know, c control of what we were going to do. And we planned the best match we could and it fucking rocked the house. And then that was it. We came to the back, and he said, okay, you guys are going to be booked more. You guys are going to be regulars. And, and he held up, to, held up to its word, and that's how it started for Ring of Honor. What was your relationship like with Gabe? It was fine. Um, I mean, Gabe and, uh, 
Like, I talk to him probably more now than I used to talk to him when I'd work for him, which is kind of funny, but... I think one of the things about Gabe... And Gabe tends to get mad at me a lot about some of the stuff I do or say. Like, he gets upset uh, about some stuff when I bring him up. He'll probably get upset about this, too, but... I think Gabe has a tendency of being really nice to the people that he needs. And then when he doesn't really need somebody or doesn't need somebody anymore, he's not going to be mean to him, but he's not going to be nice to him either. Like for that whole run where he, when he used us in 2005 and then stopped using us, he really wouldn't want to give me the time of day, which I understand. I get it. He has to deal with a lot of people. Uh, so when we came back in 2007 and we were part of, like, at that point, our, that match with the Briscoes, like, kind of rocketed us to, like, fucking, uh, you know, we were almost at the top of the tag team division uh, right away because we had such a good match with the Briscoes and, you know, people wanted to see us and the Briscoes have a feud. And I don't think that was his original plan, but I think he had to give in and do it because it was obvious that there was something there. So he was awesome to us, you know, that whole time. Until he got fired by the, by Ring of Honor later, he was really nice, and I had no problem with him, and I still don't. Just uh, like I said, his one fault maybe is that when he doesn't really need somebody, kind of really, I don't know, just doesn't really go out of his way to be nice to him. He's not mean or anything, but he's not exactly the nicest guy either. So, what are your memories of that run with Generico against the Briscoes that that kind of put you on the map in Ring of Honor? Yeah, um, I mean the memories are a lot of really good matches and a lot of really sore like bruises and fucking almost broken bones because like that feud i had with super dragon and pwg in 2005 i feel helped bring me to another level in people's eyes because of the brutality of the matches we had and if any feud comes close to that one it's the one we have with the briscoes because those guys you know, in the ring, they don't they don't fuck around. They're they're tough dudes, and they hit hard, and they go hard, and we kept up with them every step of the way, which I think they really appreciated. To this day, I think they still do. And um, I mean, if it wasn't for that feud, again, I don't think I'd be in Ring of Honor now. Like they were open to helping. They were open to us meaning something. Like if the Briscoes had wanted Steen and Generico to be just another team, they're gonna beat. We wouldn't be what we are now. But those guys wanted to help us. They knew that we wanted to fuck it. Like, they knew we loved wrestling, and they knew we wanted to steal the show, and so did they. So every time we went out there with them, we had just one goal, was to rock the house and steal the show. And I think we did that more often than not. And, yeah, I mean, uh, we had that Boston Street fight. It was probably one of the craziest matches I've been in. If you guys have seen it, you know what I'm talking about. is real crazy, and... Uh, we had the ladder war in Chicago, and we had the two out of three falls in New York, which I think gets overlooked a lot. But just so many matches. Like, I, we worked with them so so many times, whether it be in singles or tags, in that f- time frame from February to September. And uh, it's all good memories, really. Like, there's I can't say a bad word about the Briscoes and, or that feud. I had a blast, and uh, it's still something to this day that I really look back uh, fondly. When we talked to Davey Richards a couple of months uh-huh. ago, he was very critical and outspoken against the concept of the latter war uh-huh. and, and the feeling that it was a, a stunt show and it was too much. What were your thoughts on, on doing the first latter war with the Briscoes? I don't feel that way about any... Like, there's deathmatch wrestling, which I would not touch with a 10-foot pole. I would never go through a light tube or a pane of glass or fire or any of that shit. But I've done barbed wire, I've done thumbtacks... I have no problems doing tables and chairs and ladders. I think it depends on who you are and what you want to do. Like, I remember it's funny because when I started in IWS in 2003, like I said, it was a hardcore fed. And I was coming from Rujo, which was family friendly, no weapons, no swearing, none of that. And because I was a Rujo boy or whatever, Rujo guy, they, like the fans immediately uh, assumed that that would mean I wouldn't use weapons. And I didn't. Because I wanted to be different. And that's something I've always strived for in wrestling, even to this day, is I want to be different than what's out there. Um, because I'm not like other people. What works for some other people doesn't work for me. Which, you know, like 2005 in Ring of Honor is a good example. Like, I tried to just wrestle, and it just didn't work at all. So um, 
I went there in IWS and I didn't use any weapons. I would refuse to. Like people, like fans would give me chairs and I would be like, no, and I'd throw the chair down. And that's how the Mr. Wrestling thing came about, actually, is because I was the one guy who refused to use weapons. And even though I refused to use weapons, I had the best match on the show for the first six months I was there without using any of the hardcore shit that they were, the fans were accustomed to seeing. So it was almost the opposite of what I am now. And like while I didn't hate the hardcore wrestling and the tables and the chairs and the ladders, I just felt like I, I wanted it to be different, so I didn't want to use them. But eventually, you know, like the Super Dragon Feud is probably what did it, is I started in, like, you know, opening my mind to maybe I could use some of that stuff, and now, I'm, you know, it's a big part of a lot of my matches, like not necessarily the weapons, but more of a brawling type style, and I like it. I really do, and when I watch wrestling, if, like, the wrestling I watch, I enjoy that kind of those kind of matches with fucking tables and chairs and, you know, there's such a thing as too much, I think, but uh, if it's done well, I think it's awesome. Don't give up. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever fight forever and ever and ever and ever and I think Davey doesn't feel that way I think he um you know, Davey's trained in jujitsu and all these kinds of, you know, fighting techniques. And he's an at like, he prides himself on being a, an athlete and, you know, in great shape. And I'm this and I'm that. And so, you know, it makes sense that ladders and chairs and tables wouldn't be his kind of thing. But uh, for what it's worth, I think Davey does really good when he's in that kind of match. I've wrestled him in that kind of match a couple times and I think he was really good in it. But I don't feel the same way he does, for sure. I think once in a while, those matches are fucking a lot of fun. And if they're done well, if they're done right with the right opponent, I think it could easily be a highlight of any show. So I don't think that's a bad thing. Was it a big moment for you to win the Ring of Honor tag team titles? And uh, the little angle where you were good, you had a deadline or you would yeah. leave? Well, that, ain't, that whole deadline thing, I think, is dumb. Like, anytime somebody says that, it's almost, you know, it's guaranteed that they're going to do it or whatever. But uh, that didn't really help it make it any more special. But it was special just because I think the fans were ready for us to win those belts for a long time. And sometimes it'll happen where a company waits for too long. And then when it happens, it just doesn't mean as much. But I'll give Gabe credit for that one. I think he picked the right spot for us to do it. And fuck that crowd in Boston, again, to this day, is something I'll always remember. And I'll remember it forever. Like, it was crazy. My dad and my mom were there, my wife and my kid, and Generico brought his girlfriend. And, I mean, it's astonishing enough that he had a girlfriend in the first place, but that she was willing to come watch him wrestle. And then, you know, they all saw us win the belts, and the crowd, like, uh, I remember reading a comment later online about how it's like everybody in that crowd forgot for a second that, you know, it wasn't, like, this was supposed to happen. Like, what they saw, that emotion is so real. Like, even for us. Like, the reaction is something, like, I've fucking... I had never seen up to that point. It was just so genuine. And people just genuinely happy, like, hugging each other and jumping up and down. And, like, I, I'll still watch it once in a while to this day. And it's it's really uh, it's really something. So, yeah, it was really special. I mean, that reaction made it more special than I ever thought it could have been. Like, you know, it was nice that we were going to win the tag titles, but to do it in front of a crowd that was so passionate about it was really cool. Where did the idea for the heel turn come from and to split from Generico? How did all that come about? Um, that was all me. Um, I felt at one point that we had just got into, like, we couldn't do much more together. Like, we were still really entertaining, but... I felt like Ring of Honor was starting to lack teams for us to wrestle anyway. And uh, I just wanted to do something different. And I, you know, some people get into wrestling just to be wrestlers. Some people get into wrestling to make money. And I don't know, I got into wrestling because I loved it. But every promotion I go to, I aspire to win the belt eventually. Just because once you've accomplished that, I think that means you've 
gone as far as you can, like not gone as far as you can go, but you're fucking doing something right. So once we won the tag titles, my logical next step was I okay, well now I want to be the world champion eventually. So I couldn't do that if I was going to keep teaming with Generico and. I told Pierce, who was running the show at the time, that I think it was time for a change, and he didn't want to. He said no. So I went home, and I thought about this whole thing, this whole scenario, and it was going to be, like, I knew from the start that I wanted this to be a long thing, and I wanted it to be, like, really um, detailed, and, like, I wanted it to be something special. I didn't want it just to be, oh, partner turn on his partner, and then they're going to have a couple matches, and then that's it. I wanted it to be something that people get invested in, and while I was trying to think of some stuff to, like, you know, because I didn't want, like I said, I didn't want it to be just, okay, I turn on you, now you're mad at me and we'll fight. I wanted it to be layers and, and you know, just intricate shit that keeps people interested. Uh, Cabana told me, hey, I, uh, I'm i going to be in a few with Brent Albright if I don't have anything better, so can you please help me out and, like, find me a spot in there? So I did. I, I, I realized that Cabana could be... With Generico, and then I needed somebody, and I was gonna. We we had pitched the idea to Nigel McGinnis because he was still in Ring of Honor at that point, and he was he was he liked it. Uh, I actually Nigel was gonna be the reason I turned in the first place because he was doing this thing at the beginning of HDNet because I think he had gotten hurt maybe, and he couldn't really wrestle for the first few weeks of HDNet, so they were having him just kind of cut promos on wrestlers and sit in the crowd and just like I remember he cut a promo on Roderick saying oh. You look at you like uh, you're a shell of what you used to be and stuff like that. And that gave me the idea where Nigel could be almost like, you know, the puppet master behind me. But then Nigel signed with WWE or was going to sign with WWE. So he said, you guys should probably pick somebody else. So I laid out this whole idea to Pierce and we were going to go ahead with it. And then we were looking for the guy that was going to be my partner in it. And we had picked Roderick. And then Roderick wrestled... Survival of the Fittest in Indianapolis, maybe, or St. Louis. One of the... No, I think it was Indianapolis. Uh, and he he wrestled, like... Uh, he went to the, you know, the elimination match, the Survival of the Fittest, the finals. It was him and Tyler at the end. Tyler Black. And people were so crazy for Roderick. Like, it was... Like, they're really behind him. But I told Pierce, we can't take Roderick. Roderick needs to stay a babyface. Look at this reaction. And Adam agreed. So now we were back to figuring out who was going to be the other guy. Weirdly enough, Pierce ended up turning Roderick anyway a month later. I don't know why, but whatever. He wasn't going to be the guy for our angle anymore. And then Carino, out of the blue, emailed Adam Pierce saying, hey, I don't know if you have a spot for me, but I, I, you know, I'm starting to get in shape again. I'd like to come back and wrestle. And I, I know that, you know, I'm... Like, because Carino's the hardest on himself. That Like, he's his own worst critic, and he was saying, how, well, you know, I... I know I'm not young anymore, and I, I'm not looking for a big spot. I just want to, you know, wrestle and just have fun. And as soon as I heard that, like I saw, I remember I read on the Ring of Honor Newswire, like, oh, wrestling legend Steve Carino will be coming back to Ring of Honor soon. And I'm like, holy shit, Carino would be perfect for this. And Pierce emailed me, like, as I was thinking that, saying, hey, how about Carino? And so it all came together, and we were ready to go. Everything was planned before Final Battle 2009 when I turned on Generico and we had laid it out everything and we already knew we wanted it to end at Final Battle 2010 and everything pretty much went off uh, without a hitch except when Adam Pierce got fired and Jim Cornette and uh, kind of took over the creative uh, process of Ring of Honor and well that was uh, kind of a uphill battle for us at that point but uh, we stuck to our guns and it ended up coming off the way we wanted it to. How did things change when Cornette took over? How difficult did it become? Really hard. You? Really difficult. Jim Cornette does not like me. Like, uh, you know, people might watch Ring of Honor now and think I'm just saying that to be cute, but it's as true as anything else is. He doesn't like me. He wasn't a big fan of Generico. He wasn't a big fan of Cabana. He wasn't a big fan of Carino. And we were all involved in the same angle. So I think we were disposable to him. I don't think he wanted us on his show. But because he couldn't either, like, he couldn't ignore the fans. Like, it was clear what we were doing, they liked. So, and he's, you know, Cornette's a smart man, especially for wrestling. So, while he might have not loved anything we were doing or even cared, like, I don't think he cared. I don't think he even watched any of the shit we were doing. I think he had the guys that he liked. 
and he had the guys he wanted to be involved with, and the rest he kind of let other people take care of, but he would watch those guys and take care of those guys. And I don't think he ever watched any of the shit we did. Um, I think he assumed that it wasn't that good, but then he saw the fans' reaction, and he was like, oh, okay, well, I guess they are doing something right, and he was forced to go along with it until eventually he figured out a way to get rid of me. And, uh, yeah, so it was just really hard because... Um, he came in and took control about halfway through our storyline. And I think if it had been up to him, it would have been done right then and there. Like, Generico and I wrestled in, in uh, I think, in June in Toronto for their first match, one-on-one -on -one in the feud. And Adam was still there at that time, but Jim was getting more and more control. And I, I know Adam told me that Jim wanted this to be it. We have the one match, and that's it. And Adam fought for us. He's like, no, no, they have this whole thing. We, you can't do that to them. And Adam ended up uh, talking some sense into him, I guess. But he still didn't really care about it. Like, he, he kind of washed his hands of it, I think. And, uh, yeah, most of that. Not most of it. I mean, Adam had some good ideas, and he brought a lot to the table, too. But 90% of that was myself, Carino, Cabana, and Generico doing it. And, like, we, Adam would be tremendous help in that. Like, if we needed something to happen on the show for the angle to advance like let's say he had a card booked and then but we needed i don't know let i'm just complete example but like say let's say oh no we need in phoenix we need uh steve to do this so that generico can run in and then i could come out and do that well no that's that's not how i had it booked and I'm like well you got to change it and he would change it because he really believed in what we were doing so yeah i gotta give uh props to adam for that for sure Talk about some of the layers and, and what you wanted to accomplish with this. You said you wanted to be different. You wanted it to have layers. And yeah, explain just Explain uh, what you mean, what you wanted. Well, because I believe what's interesting in wrestling is shades of gray. I think when it's bla too black or, and white, it's not as interesting. So I, I never wanted it to be like Steen turn on Generico because he's a piece of shit. And Generico is a poor defenseless bastard that got turned on. I wanted people to kind of feel for me. Like, you know, some of the shit I was doing, even though I was going crazy, I wanted people to not be like, oh, Steen's a piece of shit. I wanted there to be, like, that split where some fans fucking like me, some fans hate me, and everybody loves Generico. Like, he's probably the most universally well-liked wrestler in the world. And Cabana, same thing. Like, to live crowds, like, when wherever we go or went, Cabana was fucking over as hell. Like, they were the best baby faces you could get. But I didn't want necessarily for me and Steve to be like just pieces of shit fighting the good guys. And I like Shades of Grey, so that's why I, you know, I did stuff where like I wrote that letter on the Ring of Honor website about how I felt like Cole Cabana at Pick Generico, like in our friendship, always favored Generico to me and he wasn't that good of a friend to me. And I'm a guy that uses real life in a lot of the stuff I do just because I feel like it's it's there and it's it's good. Like I like when stuff feels as genuine as possible so a lot of that shit in that letter was pretty genuine and um you know if you read that letter even cabana told me like you come off like a baby face i come off like a piece of shit but i'm like yeah well you know what people do pieces of shit things but that doesn't mean they're pieces of shit you know people do bad things it doesn't mean they're evil but i feel like that's what's interesting in wrestling and i wanted stuff like that and also we needed a lot of twists and turns to make it last as long as we wanted it to and i think steve and colt were amazing in that like we and you know that's such a credit to them that they like that storyline the payoff was going to be me and generico but they were more than happy to almost like take a back seat and be there as our supporting roles and they loved like they did amazing and they were so unselfish like Literally, like, these two guys have more experience than we did. Steve has been wrestling forever. Colt was wrestling for long before we did. These guys had more exposure and more experience than either of us, and yet they came to us and would say, like, what do you need from us? Which is so incredible, and I can't thank them enough for that, ever. Um, and, yeah, they were always there when we needed them, and they were great tools for the storyline and the whole angle, and they brought a whole other layer. Like, you had Steve, who was the veteran who felt like he had a lot to prove which is why he planted those seeds in me and that's what ultimately led to me turning on generico and cabana just wanted to keep everybody together because he was friends with me he was friends with 
Steve, he was friends with Generico, but then he had to pick a side because we, me and Steve were obviously out of our fucking mind. And then there was the whole thing where Generico couldn't hit me because he didn't want to hit me. Like in his mind, he still wanted us to be together. And, you know, in New York City, he was going to hit Karina with a chair in February and I stepped in front of him and he couldn't hit me. But the first chance I got, I hit him. And then finally, like he lost his mind. And like that moment, that's the one thing if I could do over, I would do over is the moment in my head, the moment where Generico finally hit me, I wanted it to be in Toronto, in I think in May, and just because of timing wise, we ha oh no, I'm wrong. I wanted it to be in New York in May, and for some reason Generico couldn't be at that show, so we did it in April in Charlotte, which is kind of funny because this is where we're at now. But we did it in Charlotte, in front of a crowd that honestly I think. It wasn't the right crowd. Ring of Honor had never ran Charlotte before, I don't think, at that point. And it was more of a Jim Cornette spot show than an actual Ring of Honor show. So I think a lot of those fans didn't even really follow Ring of Honor. So that moment, I think, was lost. Like, we didn't get... Like, that moment didn't get the reaction I hoped it would get. But, you know, whatever. It still worked. And then we had the Chicago Street Fight and they laid steve out and like that was their first shot back at us like for this whole time we were fucking with them and now they beat us in chicago and they beat us decisively and then that led to the match with me and generico and um in uh toronto that was the first one and like there was all these layers that we came up with and uh generico, generico came up with the uh, unmasking in new york city <laughs> Um, that was another layer that actually wasn't even planned originally when we came up with the idea. He just came up with it later, and that was, you know, it it looked like our thing was winding down at that point to most fans, I think. We had had the one-on-one the -on -one in Toronto, and then we wrestled in St. Louis, and he beat the shit out of me. And then we had the cage match on HDNet. We had another street fight tag match, and then we had the chain match, which to a lot of people, I think, looked like it was going to be the blow-off. But it wasn't because I ripped his mask off and then we were off the races for final battle. So that's what I mean by layers is we had all these things sprinkled in to keep people interested throughout the whole thing. And it worked really well. So what happened on the road to final battle? This is where, would it be safe to say this is where your, your relationship with Jim Cornette really... Uh... It wasn't good from the start. Like I saw that this guy had no interest in what we were doing. And I, um, actually, I remember before things got real bad, uh, I wrestled, I was booked on that, when Adam got, like, the last thing that Adam booked in Ring of Honor was me versus Tyler Black for the belt in Chicago. And Tyler was one of the guys that Jim really took care of. Like, he, he paid attention to what Tyler was doing, and he would make sure that, you know, Tyler never looked bad or anything like that. So he paid close attention to every match Tyler had, except when me and Tyler wrestled. Jim was nowhere to be found. He didn't give a shit. So me and Tyler planned the match, and I think we ended up having a really good match. I really liked that match, and um, I think a lot of people liked it a lot too. And that was the last thing Adam booked, and then um, Adam got fired after. And the show after, I was booked against Davey and Roderick, back-to-back -back Friday, Saturday. And Davey and Roderick were the other two guys that Jim really paid a ch close attention to. So I almost felt like going into that weekend where we were already all aware, like me, Steve Generico, and Carino, that, uh, me and Colt, that Jim Cornette wasn't our biggest fan at all. And I think Adam really, like we'd ask Adam all the time, like, what the fuck does Jim have against us? And he's like, no, he has nothing against you guys. He has nothing against you guys. But he was bullshitting us. And he admitted it to us later. But, um... At that point, I felt like I had really had something to prove to Jim against Davey and Roderick, especially against Davey, because whether Davey likes it or not, and I know he talked about it in his interview that he did with you guys, he, like, he never meant to be Jim's boy, but Jim fucking picked him as his boy. I know, I know Davey didn't like it, but that's just the way it was. Like, you couldn't deny it. So, Davey and I went out there and had this match, and, uh... You know, I think it was really overlooked. I think it was really good. And I really liked that match. And, like, we went a little crazy. Like, the finish was pretty nuts. Like, Davey kicked me in the face fucking 25 times if he kicked me once. And, like, people were not... Like, by the time the finish happened, people were going really crazy. Like, 
we had the crowd in the palm of our hands and I walked out and the first thing I did as soon as I walked out Jim came up to me because he he knew he had seen something really good and he wanted to come congratulate me and I just took him aside and kind of like everybody saw me do it so kind of you know people knew something was up and I told him I'm like listen like I know we got off on the wrong foot for various reasons, but I I can go and I can be a top fucking guy here, and I just show you that I can wrestle the top guys no problem. So stop being blind to what I can do, and open your fucking eyes. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, no, I I know you can go. Don't worry about it. Everything's gonna be fine. And you know, you have my seal of approval. All this shit, which is not true, because the first thing he did after was forgot a way to get rid of me after the generico storyline, but. You know, I uh, I really tried, and I think that's where it got a little bad is when he said that, and then did the opposite. So how was didn't that? endear him to me for sure. How was that sprung on you? What's that? How was the loser leaves town sprung on you? Just out of the blue, like, hey, why don't we do? You lose, and you know, if if you lose, generic, uh, you leave, and if Generico loses, you get his mask. I'm like, all right, what happens when I lose? You go home for a while. Like, what do you mean for a while? It's like, ah, you know, for a while, you go home for a while, we'll figure something out, and then you'll come back. And then I was really angry, but then I think, um, at that point, I realized that it was the best way for all of this to end for me and Generico. And I felt, at least the understanding I had was that once that happened, Generico would be pushed heavily, and, um, I honestly thought they were going to put the belt on him, which they should have. But they didn't. That's whatever. So I decided to do it. I figured, fuck it. I, they might not bring me back. And if they do, great. But I said yes because I figured that um, it was the best way for our story to end. And if that story was the last thing I did in Ring of Honor, then that, that was fine with me. And then once it happened, uh, I was kind of ready to just quit wrestling, honestly. Or at least take an extended break just because... I had had a lot of really good matches that year, and I had that angle with Generico, and I felt like that was the best of me, you know, like creatively and in the mat, like I, in the ring, I had given a lot, and I was feeling it now. Like I just felt like I needed a bit of a break, so I thought once I lose to Generico, it's pretty much gonna be it. But then, you know, fucking PWG, like for the, from 2008 to 2010, I didn't really wrestle in PWG at all. I had did one show here and there. And then I did, like, I almost made the mistake of doing PWG right before that because, like I said, in my mind, December 2010 was going to be it. And I hadn't really told anybody. And I, uh, Dragon told me, okay, we'll do you and Tozawa. I hadn't been in PWG in six months at that point. So I'm like, okay, great. I'll have to, I'll get to wrestle Tozawa and then I'll get to wrestle Generico and then I can, you know, go home and eventually maybe I'll come back or maybe I won't. But if anything's going to close off my career, good, it would be those two matches. And I fucking had so much fun in PWG with Tozawa that when I got to the back, Dragon's like, okay, can you come in January? And I'm like, yeah, all right. And then I was just back in PWG full time and I started wrestling more at home without the Ring of Honor dates anymore. And I started enjoying that a lot and I started doing training seminars and I kind of felt uh, a little bit of a renewed interest in wrestling that have kind of been taken away from me when... I saw that everything we had done that year and the, all the hardware we had put in that year basically didn't mean nothing to people running the show. Not that it didn't mean nothing, but it didn't mean that much. You know what I mean? So, Is it true Cornette did not want you guys to go last? Uh, I don't know that that's true, but I'll tell you what my assumption is. Adam Pierce was going to have us last at Final Battle. We knew that six months before time. Then... Jim took over, and I immediately assumed that we weren't going to be last, which was fine. I didn't really give a fuck, but everybody knows we should... Everybody knew we should go on last. And then Roderick versus Davey was going to be the title match, so I knew in my head for sure that we weren't going on last. And then I had heard that we were going to be right before intermission, which is so funny to me, especially with the stip we had, but whatever. Then I heard we were going to be semi-main, which was fine, too. I didn't care. And then... I saw the whole thing with the, oh, uh, the match is unsanctioned, so it's not really part of Final Battle. So the main event is Roderick Strong versus Davey Richards. But after, after the main event, it's going to be Steen Generico, which I think was Jim's way. And I'm just assuming this. I don't know this for a fact, but I think that was Jim's way 
of having his boys, sorry Roddy and sorry Davey, but having his boys be the main event and having us not be the main event, but making sure that they didn't have to follow us. But really, you know, we were the main event. <laughs> we're on the cover of the DVD, even though we weren't part of the official show. So, What kind of roadblocks did you face trying to come back? Um, I didn't really feel roadblocks. I think eventually they threw an idea at me for, to come back, and I didn't really feel comfortable with it. I didn't think it was that good. And then I threw an idea at them, and then we kind of worked together in doing it. But Jim wasn't involved in that whole thing, like, I didn't know, I didn't even really know if Jim gave a fuck that I was coming back or not. I think he did it. I think I was brought back because they had to bring me back. Like, I think the fan, it was clear the fans wanted me back. And sometimes I think when fans want something bad enough, you can't really ignore it, you know? So they brought me back and uh, we did that, uh, that thing in New York where I said, fuck Ring of Honor. And it was clear that something was work, like that was going to work. So we ran with it. Where did that come from, the, the anti-Ring of Honor sentiment? It came from what I was feeling. I mean, I wasn't happy. I mean, as far as incorporating it into into a, a character or a promo or an interview. Well, I was already doing the thing before when I was wrestling Generico, the whole feud with Generico where I, I was going crazy. So if I couldn't feud with Generico anymore, I figured I might as well fucking fight the entire world, you know? So that was... I don't want to say it was my idea because I think it was brought to me by them and I think it was just a teamwork of finding the best for everybody and now we're running with this. What did you expect early on? You said earlier that winning the Ring of Honor world title was a goal long yeah. term. When you came back and when this thing started to get momentum, was that still your goal or yeah. did you feel like you'd been deterred off of that I felt that I uh, I felt it was obvious from that moment in, in New York when I said fuck Ring of Honor and people went nuts I felt like that's it like I I'm gonna fucking win the world title because it's my turn to win like not my turn to win the world title but I think it's undeniable that I fucking deserve it and it would be good and it would be a good story and there would be a lot of fucking room to grow for it and uh that's when i started talking shit about davy because i felt like it was my turn now like i was i was home for a year and now that i was giving the i was given the fucking mic and i was given the spotlight i was gonna take all of it and that might be selfish and mean but um I don't know, I just felt like this was my fucking time now, so I, I did everything I could to... I, I did everything I could to just fucking create buzz and have people talk about what I was doing. I don't give a shit if they cheer or boo, but I wanted it to be a big deal, and I think I accomplished that um, by the promos and just the crazy shit of like trying to pack, like give Carrie Silk in the package pile driver and all that stuff, just... I think uh, it worked out really good. Was Carrie down for that? Was he excited to do it? I or? think he was, yeah. I think uh, I think Carrie really likes being a part of it still. Even though he doesn't own the company anymore, I think he really likes being a part of it. He always loved wrestling and Ring of Honor in particular, so whenever he gets to be involved a little bit, like I, I think he knows his limit limitations, which is really good. Like He doesn't want to go overboard. But he, I, and also I think he tr he has a lot of trust in me, and he knows that I, I you know, I, I, I want, like, I think he doesn't want to look like an idiot out there, you know what I mean? Like, he doesn't want to bring down the show by doing something that would look bad or stupid. But yeah, I think he really likes uh, getting involved and mixing it up a little bit. So as you start doing these crazy things, these, these kind of stunts during the show to get attention yeah. what's the what's the reaction from the boys from the office is there tension or are they there's, behind you there's tension with the office for sure because uh, they don't we don't like it was weird we didn't talk to each other like we know basically yeah I was gonna come in Chicago and fuck the show up but I didn't tell them anything I was gonna do like they didn't know I was gonna have a Cole Cabana shirt on and shit like that and that was genuine reactions like when I took like, this thing was, I, I showed up in the front row to fuck the show up, and Jim came out, and I unzipped my hoodie, and I had a Cole Cabana shirt on, I'm like, you like my shirt? And this fucking, like, the anger in his face is legitimate. Like, I, I, 
you know, <laughs> it's, it's fucking weird. And then we have this whole big brawl and they take me out the front door and Jim's there and I'm fucking tossing chairs at this like 50 something old year old man who has bad knees and shit. And I don't give a fuck if it hits him. Like I, this is to me, this is what I wish I could have done for so long when I was at home and Jim, you know, Jim has his issues with me and we just let it fucking fly and it's a lot of fun, but it's also, you know, there's tension for sure because I'm spinning at him. Like his wife, I know for a fact his wife wanted to fucking fight me because I'm spinning at this guy, like in his face and she hates it, but I don't care. Like if you, you could spit on me too. I don't give a shit. Like that's the way I am in the ring too in a lot of ways is I, I can take what I dish out, you know, and I don't. I don't know. I just feel whatever gives the best show. And I don't know. If they want to take shots at me, there's kind of nothing that's off limits. And for me either, like, I, I'm not afraid of talking about shit that could get people pissed off. Because to me, I feel like it's whatever works for the, whatever, whatever works best for what we're trying to do. So there's definitely tension because we didn't really know what we were going to do. And we just kind of did it out there. And sometimes... I guess I guess one of the chairs I threw like I threw for example hurt, like fucked him up a little bit and he didn't he, you know he wasn't my biggest fan after but we're, he's already not my biggest fan so what does it matter you know what I mean and then um, fuck I was gonna say something else about something that happened but I've just lost it now sorry what was the question just really, well from from what you're talking about now yeah. what's your relationship like with Jim Cornette like on a is there a conversation the day of the TV taping? Do we all just go out there and do it? Like, what's your your relationship, uh, your level of communication with him? I think he's learned... I think we've learned to kind of work with each other in the sense that um, he knows that most of what he'll tell me will fly right above my head, and he, I know that most of the shit I'll throw at him, he won't give a fuck. So, like, we've done countless promos with each other, but we didn't really know where we were going to go. And we've said some pretty stiff shit about each other too, and that's fine because it comes from like it comes from down deep, you know. And I, in a way, man, it's not a bad way to work. I think, uh, I think it's interesting, and I think people can see it, and I like it. Like, um, we don't really have conversations. If I have to talk to somebody about something, I don't go to him. And I don't think he enjoys talking to me really either. So unless we really have to talk to each other, we don't. And it works fine for both of us. What's your relationship like with Davey Richards? Um, it's fine. Uh, I know like a lot of people expected me to shit talk him here because of what he said in the interview he did with you guys. But uh, somebody sent me the part about me from his interview a couple weeks ago. And I listened to it. And then I called him which I called him and I spoke to him on the phone, which I think is what he should have done if he had such problems with me. Uh, I called him and I, I told him the way I felt and I was like, i kind of surprised at the shit you said about me. And if you really felt that way, I wish that you would have just fucking sat me down and talked to me instead of waiting for a shoot interview. I said, because I have my own interview coming up in a month and instead of waiting for my comeback to yours now, like for the interview, I'm calling you now because to me, like, Davey was my friend, and our friendship meant a lot more than a shoot interview. So I told him that, and uh, we talked about a lot of the shit that went on and a lot of the stuff I said about him, and I explained why I said those things, and I think, uh, ultimately, we both apologized to each other, which might be really disappointing to some of the people that are listening to this, but I'm a normal guy that wrestles. I'm not a fucking worker. I'm not one of these guys that lives, you know, in wrestling world all the time like Davey is my friend he's I've heard about some of his personal issues he's heard about some of my personal issues my personal lives like we are friends so what happened in the ring and what happened on the mic it our real life is more important to me than that so when he should talk me on that interview I called him and I asked him why and he explained and then I explained and Ultimately, we both apologized to each other because shit got out of hand, but now we're fine and we're friends and I haven't seen him since, but next time I see him, I'll shake his hand and I'll be happy to see him. Um, I just wish he had had the common sense to do what I did, which is to tell, tell me the problem he had with me instead of wait to do it in front of this camera. But I, I think that Davey... And I told him this on the phone, and I'll t say it now. I think Davey's biggest problem is he doesn't think of consequences before he does things or talks. 
like he gets wrapped up and he he's an impulsive person and it, whether it's talking shit about me or running out on a promoter because he felt he was disrespected um I don't think he thinks of what's going to happen in an hour and two hours or how it's going to affect the people that aren't him. I think he realizes that later, though. Like, I may be, uh, maybe I'm assuming too much and I, I could be wrong, but I f I'm sure that once he left with the money, about two hours later or so, or maybe even 20 minutes later, he realized he fucked up. I'm sure of it. Not that he fucked up in the sense that, hey, I wasn't there, so I don't know what the real story is because... There's always going to be, like, nobody, you'll never hear the truth. Even if people give both, like, the promoter's side of the story and Davey's side of the story, both those stories are full of shit. Because they will omit facts that make themselves look bad. Not because they want to, just because in your brain, you see a situation differently than what it really is, always. So what the promoter says is not true, and what Davey says isn't true. There's parts of both stories that are true, and then the real fucking situation that happened, nobody will ever know. But I'm sure the promoter thought he was right, and I'm sure Davey thought he was right. And I think either of, like, both of them did what they, they needed to do for themselves. But I'm sure that Davey, I'm sure, I mean, like I said, I assume, and I'm pretty sure that I'm right, but I could be wrong, that Davey regretted leaving with the money. I don't think he was trying to steal the money. I don't think he wanted to steal the money. I think he's just trying to make a point. And then I think maybe, I don't know, I'm sure it didn't take that long for him to realize that, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But then it was too late. And I think instead of apologizing, he tends to just kind of try to turn it around and make it something else. So I think that's what he did there again, and whatever. Shit's, like, things are, like, that shit's done now. Who cares, really? It's been a couple of weeks, but... Yeah, I think that's his biggest problem. He doesn't really think of consequences before he acts or talks until it's maybe a little bit too late. But I don't think that makes him a bad guy at all. So it's been your goal all along to be the Ring of Honor World Champion. Mm -hmm. Now we are going to wrestle Davey Richards, who you've known for years going back to PWG, Yeah. for the title. This is, you know, the moment that everything has been building towards. What's your mindset in that moment? Did you, did you really think when you were bucking the system that it would still happen? Like, did you really... Oh, were, I didn't, were you surprised that, it, that you ended up in that moment? Like, just kind of take um, us in your mind in that, in the lead up to that match. I didn't know that it was going to happen until, a, like, a couple <clears throat> weeks before. Like, I, I was pretty sure... I thought the whole time that I was going to be the monster that Davey slays. You know what I mean? Like, I was going to be the one thing that Davey does that really puts him over the top as, like, the fucking best Ring of Honor champion ever. Like, he... But, I don't know, they had other plans, and, you know, I'm obviously fine with those plans. But I did feel that eventually I would be the champion. I didn't think I would be the one to beat Davey, but I felt like, you know, if you stay interesting enough for a long enough time... Like, I actually... I remember Kendrick says that in his first shoot interview he did with you guys, where eventually the cream rises to the top. Like, if you stick around long enough, and if you're good enough, uh, you know, what you're doing for long enough, it can't be avoided. Obviously, Ring of Honor is not, like, it's not WWE. Like, it works differently in WWE. It could take a lot longer for the cream to rise to the top. But I felt that if I kept doing what I was doing and I kept being different and interesting and I kept being the highlight of the show, then there was no way I was going to be kept down or not kept down, but there's no way that I was just not going to be at the top eventually. And I think I was right. I just think it was pretty quickly, you know. How special was that moment in that match to you? It was pretty special, like, my parents were there again, and my wife was there, and there was a lot of people that were there, like, a lot of wrestlers from Quebec that I trained and that I wrestled with came up to watch the show, and um, it was a lot of fun, and, you know, I, 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 I know if you see, if you watch the footage, like, once I win, I just kind of sit there for a good minute, just because it was, I just took some time to think about how weird it was in a way that, like, 18 months before that, I really thought that I was never going to wrestle Ring of Honor again. And just how, I don't know, things change and plans change and you never know where shit's going to take you. And now it was like a new beginning in my head a little bit. Like, now I was a champion and now I want to make that interesting. I want to make that appealing and I have to find ways to keep that interesting for people. And then I kind of snapped out of that and... Jimmy Jacobs was there, and Jimmy's a close friend of mine, and he was really, really happy for me because it's almost like 
you know, we won it together. Like, Jimmy's been through a lot of the same stuff with Ring of Honor. Like, he was, he went away for a while, and then he wasn't really brought back, and, you know, he wasn't sure where things were going, and then he was brought back, and it wasn't, you know, anything glorious, and then, you know, finally he got to be what he wanted to be, which is, you know, turn, he turned and he joined me, and then we were having a lot of fun together. So when I won the belt, it was really special to him too, I think, and he's been such help since i came back like i again that's another guy i really can't thank enough like he's so selfless like he's there whenever i need him and i really appreciate that and then what really made it as special as it was going to get is when steve got in the ring and we got to hug all three of us like steve and i have wanted to be back together for a long time and we finally got it to do it there and me winning the belt meant a lot to steve too and like i'm really close with those guys and uh it was really nice to see how happy they were for me. And, like, Todd Sinclair was the ref of the match. He's one of my best friends, too, and he was the ref. So, you know, it was all just little things that were real special. And it was, it was really cool. You know, I accomplished something I really wanted to do. But the thing is, as special as it was, I didn't let it, you know, just I didn't let it ground me. Like, now I want to take it somewhere else and make it really good. I want it to be different, too. And I, I now I have to start thinking of how I'm going to stay interesting and fresh. So you talked about the the maybe I guess you'd call it the level of independence that you have with some of the companies that you work. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that kind of tends to go hand in hand with those groups is it, the audiences sometimes are different, but they all attract kind of the same breed of fan. The mm. the internet fan, the knowledgeable, the passionate, the diehard fan. Um, you've you've spent most of your career performing in front of that audience. Yeah. Um, what's your feelings towards towards that crowd and that the attitude that they bring to to wrestling? How tuned in do you feel to the fan base? I think I'm actually pretty, like, tuned in pretty well, just because I think I am one of those fans. Like, to, you know, a lot of people might think that's not a good thing to say, but I am, I'm a fan. I'm a huge wrestling fan, and I love wrestling, and I love watching it. Like, I get excited when I'm on early, and I get to watch the matches that are after me. Like, I literally get excited. That's part of, like, I'll look at the lineup, and like, oh, I'm fucking third. That's awesome. Now I get to see this match and this match, which I really wanted to see. And at PWG, I think if people watch PWG and hear me on commentary, I'm always asking, like, please, I want to be on commentary for this, this, this. And when I'm on commentary, I have a blast watching wrestling. I really love it. And before I started wrestling on the indies, I was on the Internet. I, I, I was part of message boards and shit like that. So I, I'm part of that world, you know what I mean? And now uh, Ring of Honor and PWG, for example, came up, like... It, it was basically made because fans of that, like the internet fans, like the Smarks, if you want to call them, that's who made those companies in a way because they were like they would watch it, talk about them, all that stuff. So, um, as many like a lot of wrestlers are gonna say, oh, fucking internet marks don't matter. I don't believe that. I think they do, and I, I more often than not, kind of wrestle for them. Because I wrestle, I've said this before, I kind of wrestle for me too. Like, I like to wrestle the way I, you know, if I was a, just, like, if I was a fan buying that show, I would like my match, you know, I, I'd want, I want to make sure that the match I'm having is something that I'd like to watch. So that's basically it. So I feel like I'm pretty tuned into the internet crowd or whatever you want to call it because I feel like I'm kind of part of it too, like, even to this day. I've said this before, too, on interviews or whatever. I still go on the message boards, and I look up shit that happened in the companies that I don't wrestle for, and I follow stuff from everywhere. And, you know, like, $5 Wrestling will have their pay-per-views. I'll follow it. And the other day, I bought the Dragon Gate shows. Like, I paid for them to watch the shows because I wanted to fucking watch Chuck Taylor and Generico and Tozawa and all those guys and, cause, and the Smash Brothers because I like, I really like watching wrestling. So I am a fan. I'm a... I'm a fan who wrestles. <laughs> that might sound really awful, but that is that is what I am. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm pretty tuned in. What would you say your tastes are? Uh, wrestlers you like to watch or styles or promotions? or like? I mean, like the wrestlers I, like, I really like to watch. Uh, 
I mean, I like watching everybody, really. I like I, I watched the Dragon Gate USA shows, and I thought uh, Gargano and and Chuck Taylor had a really good match, and uh, Chuck wrestled Rich Swan. I really like that match too. The Smash Brothers, you know, I'm I'm maybe a bit biased because they came up, and I felt like I helped them a little bit come up, and I'm friends with those guys. But I really genuinely enjoy their matches, and the Young Bucks I think are incredible, and I think. They get a lot. They catch a lot of uh, uh, shit from fans, and I think that's fucking crazy. I honestly don't understand anyone who doesn't like the Bucks. Uh, they're great at what they do. They have great characters or attitudes, and their matches are always so much fun. So I don't understand why anybody would dislike them. But of course, there's people that dislike them because you know, fuck. Uh, I'm sure I dislike some guys that other people love, so it's normal. But to me, I think there's some. They're probably like the top tag team. I really enjoy watching Briscoe's matches. Eddie Edwards, I really love watching. And, uh, God, there's so many of them, really. Uh, I, I, I just, I really like watching wrestling, and I'm open to almost all kinds of wrestling, so I can't really tell you if there's a, like a, a specific style that I enjoy. I mean, I don't like Lucha Libre. I just don't, I've never liked it. I don't get into it. I don't watch it. And um, I'm not crazy about, like, strong style... I guess, I don't know, I'm going to say Noah style, but honestly, I don't watch Japanese wrestling that much because I'm not really into it. So I, I you know, I was saying Noah style, but I could be wrong. Maybe Noah doesn't do that kind of stuff anymore at all. But I've, I remember back, actually, back in the days when all the PWG crew would hang out before the shows, they would watch a lot of Noah stuff from like 06, 05, whatever. And I would watch it and I... I didn't think it was bad by any means. Like those, like Kenta and Kobashi and all those dudes are amazing, obviously, but... The style of wrestling they did kind of, I don't know, I just kind of didn't get uh, drawn in that much. Don't give up. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Fight forever. And ever, and ever, and ever! And um, it's funny too, because some people say that I, they find I do that style of wrestling, which I don't think I do, but... I don't know, I, I can't say that I have a specific style that I really love, I just, I love good wrestling, and I love when wrestling's exciting and fun, and I think all the guys I named uh, make wrestling fun and exciting, so, uh, and you know, most, mostly like I'll watch every PWG show and fucking love it, um, that's probably my favorite play, like, fed to watch, but I'll watch WWE and I'll enjoy them too, like I'm able to enjoy like a little bit of everything you know what I mean like a lot of people will shit on WWE just because it's WWE and like I'll give an example like the big show for example some people really hate because it's the big show but I personally really enjoy some of his work so I think I'm I'm really open-minded as a wrestling fan and I find of uh, I find a bit of enjoyment in everything I see mostly anyway talks about going on the message boards and, and things like that do you do you have responses do things trigger responses in you or you just kind of want the feedback do you get pissed about some things you read does it no not really i bother don't you? i i think i'm really good at uh at using feedback to my advantage like i even a couple of weeks ago i actually got into a dialogue with this guy that really like hates me like he's tweeted at me like shit talking me and he just didn't like my, he doesn't like my style, he doesn't like me, he doesn't like, like the fact that I don't work out, he doesn't like my wrestling, he feels that I take shortcuts or whatever, and I do garbage wrestling, stuff like that. And, but you know, just because he says that, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, how could I say, I'm not gonna ignore what he's saying, I, I will take it into consider, consideration, like, that dude, I guess, uh, did a little podcast and reviewed some of my PWG matches because a lot of the times he would shit talk me would be Ring of Honor matches and he would say, oh, you know, he's, he's doing stuff that's not safe, whatever, whatever, and fans would tell him, watch his PWG stuff, he doesn't do that stuff over there. 
and then I, I I didn't actually get the chance to listen to that podcast, but he he reviewed some of my PWG matches, and I know that he wasn't crazy about me still. Uh, but he said something on Twitter about my match with Finley, and then I I I open a dialogue with him. I direct message him myself to say, well, I think you have a great point in this. And then we had a, a decent conversation about wrestling and his point of view on wrestling and my point of view on wrestling. And to some people, they might think that that's crazy that I'm a wrestler and I'm talking to a fan about it. But I don't think that's crazy at all. Because the guy has a different view on things. Like, he doesn't... Li- Most people like me. He doesn't like me. I want to know why. Not because I want him to like me. But because I want to know what... You know, maybe he's got valid points. And I should take those into consideration so that I can be better. You know, because let's be honest, there's fans that it's obvious you won't learn nothing from. Like the guy who fucking tweets at me like, eh, when you go into WWE to fight punk, like I know this fucking guy ain't going to bring nothing to me if I start talking about wrestling with him. But if the guy seems to have valid opinions and can put a, a sentence together properly and, you know, doesn't write, doesn't write like an 11 year old girl, he must have, you know, he has a brain and like I could talk to this guy. And I did, like, we had a dialogue, and we talked a, bit, a little bit about, like, you know, his views on wrestling, my views on wrestling, stuff like that, and it was really interesting, and I actually think I did learn something. Like, I'm like, oh, well, he's got an interesting point. i had never seen it that way before. Which is why I read message boards and stuff like that, and, you know, so many wrestlers will say, mm, fuck the internet, fuck the message boards. <laughs> That's, you're kidding yourself, man. Because nobody says fuck the message boards. If you're saying fuck the message boards because you read it and what you read you didn't like because they were maybe one guy said something bad about you. But open your fucking mind. Not everybody's going to suck your dick. And I love, I love getting my dick sucked on the message boards. I really like it. Like it makes me feel great. And call me a fucking mark. I don't care. It's awesome. It's nice to know people appreciate your work. It really is. But it's also nice to know what people don't appreciate about your work. I really, I like that. And it's not just me. I read, I, like I said, I read about everything. I'll read about the last CCW show, or I'll read about what happened in Japan, or I'll read about Dragon Gate USA, or, you know what I mean? Because I like to keep up with everything, and I like to, I like to keep an open mind. Back in the day, for example, like, Gabe, uh, when he worked for Ring of Honor, would get reviews of DVDs, like he would send DVDs to Lance Storm, and then he would get reviews of the show. And he would send what Lance Storm had to say about our match to each guy. But I told Gabe that I watched the shows. So I would love to have everything. Like, I know, you know, obviously if he's burying a guy and Gabe's not comfortable with me seeing that, fine. But, you know, like, for a show, for example, I'd watch, uh, like, I, I don't know, Lance Storm comment, like, com- made some comments about my match with Brent Albright. And then... Uh, the main event of that show was Aries versus Claudio, I think, and I watched that match, and I thought it was really good. And I was curious to know what Lance Storm thought, because that guy has a fucking ton of experience, and I want to know what he thought could have been better from those guys, or what they did right, so that I could try to learn from that. So Gabe would uh, end up sending me the whole review that Lance Storm would do, and then I would read about that, even if it had nothing to do with me, because I feel like I can learn from everything. Uh, so yeah, um... I don't remember the question, but that's basically all I had to say on the topic. Um, we want to touch on a couple of places that you that you've been that we it didn't it hadn't really fit in yet in the, uh, in the yeah. course of events. Uh, talk about your experiences at Dragon Gate going to Japan. Um, yeah, I really like going to Dragon Gate. Uh, two months was maybe a bit long. Uh, I mean, for some guys, it's probably nothing. But I never dreamed of wrestling in Japan until you know. I started doing indies in the States, and then I saw guys going in Japan. And, like, Steve Carino, after I wrestled him in 2004, brought me to, over to zero one for one match, and I really enjoyed it. And then I was like, well, I'd like to go back to Japan, you know? And then Dragon Gate uh, offered me that chance, and I, I I was really excited to go. And I have thought, even if it's two months, I'm sure it'll be really, like, something, you know, a really unique experience. And uh, it was. I went there, and I loved the matches. I loved the... You know, I, it was a learning experience as far as a different style of wrestling and different style of crowd. Uh, but the actual being in Japan for two months got a little rough. Like after a month, I was really, like, really ready to come home. And uh, I was over there with Jack Evans, and you know, we'd get shit faced 
so fucking like I I'm not a big drinker, but over there I drank almost every night with him because he he fucking what do you want to do? Uh, let's go to the bar, and we did, and then we had a blast together. But you know, after a while that got old too, and then Jack went to L.A. to shoot uh, wrestling, wrestle wrestle society or whatever the MTV show. So he was gone for like a week, and I was literally by myself for that whole week, and. It was the one week through the whole two months I was there that Dragon Gate didn't have any shows. So for a week, like six days, seven days, I was stuck by myself in Japan uh, in a land that doesn't speak my language with nothing to do. So that week really wore on me, and I was really ready to come home. So, you know, as much as I loved wrestling over there, I do have some, you know, negative memories just because fucking being in Japan for so long just wasn't my cup of tea, really. And... um but ultimately, it was a really positive uh, experience, and I got to work with some really good guys. And um, like, I I would have went back. They wanted me back. I think they wanted me full time. Honestly, from what I understood, they it seemed like the door was wide open for me to come back at any time for as long as I wanted. But when I came home, I don't know. I was back with my family, and I realized like I just kind of didn't want to go back to Japan. And then stuff happened, like. Uh, my mom got sick and I just couldn't go, you know, I, like I was supposed to go in February, I think, and I couldn't go. I didn't want to leave her that way. So I told them, sorry, I can't go for this one. And they were like, okay, it's fine. Just let us know when you can come back. And then my wife got pregnant and I was like, I'm not going back to Japan now, you know? So I told Dragon Gate, I'm sorry. I don't think I'll be going back. I can't go for months at a time. And they offered and they were like, come back for two weeks, come back for, for a week. And even that I didn't want to do. Like I haven't been overseas since 2007. Uh, last time I went, I was with PWG for France, Germany, or France, England, and Germany. We did like three shows in three days, and that was it for me. Like I, I just I don't want to be away for that long, and that far. I just kind of don't. As much as I enjoyed the wrestling, I always wanted to make my name here, in you know, in America. So, also like the Dragon Gate thing coincided with my return in Ring of Honor, and I felt like kind of I kind of had to make a choice. Like I couldn't really do both. I didn't want to go to Dragon Gate for two weeks and miss Ring of Honor shows, then come back and do Ring of Honor for a month and then not go, like miss Dragon Gate shows. Like I felt like that would be counterproductive. So I chose to stay here because this is where my family is and this is where I always wanted to make a name for myself anyway. But it was a really good experience and I, you know, I recommend uh, any wrestler that has the chance to go to, to go at least once. You've made a couple of stops in Chikara over the years. A few, well, yeah. What was your experiences like there? Well, the first two were awful. No, that's not true. The first one was actually really fun. I did a tag tournament with Generico, wrestled uh, All Money is Legal in like 2005, I think. And it was a lot of fun. Like we had a pretty good match with those guys. And then we wrestled DJ Iden and John Dahmer. And then uh, we wrestled Quack and Bush and Hero like the next day. And all those matches were a lot of fun. So the first time I went, I'd say I really enjoyed it. But uh, then I went back a year later for the same tag tournament and it was a bit of a almost like a bit of a favor I was doing to Quackenbush because I was injured my knee was fucked and I had said I was going to go to team with Eddie and we we're going to be team IWS but then when I uh, when I injured my knee even more a week before the show I was in Germany for PWG actually I called Mike from Germany and I said man I don't think I can do your show I, I'm hurt and he's like oh please please do it, we'll make sure it's easy on you, I have nobody else, and you know, like, your team is kind of a team that people want to see, please just come, and I'm like, all right, fine, so I went, and then, uh, it was the first time, it was the, f the first match was me and Eddie, and Sexy Eddie's one of the nicest guys you could ever meet, I think everybody who's met him would say that, against Jigsaw and Eric Cannon, and what happened was, uh, at one point, Eric Cannon, like, kind of, uh, tied up Eddie in like a little pretzel thing in such a way that Eddie's arms were behind his back and he, Eric could like just chop the shit out of him while Eddie was in that pretzel. But Eddie had no way to defend himself, no way to fight back, nothing because he was all tied up. And Cannon must have chopped him like three, four times in the chest. And for some reason, it really pissed me off that he was doing that because I felt like there was no way, like if Eddie... You know, if for, if for some reason Eddie didn't want to fucking take four chops, he had no choice. And Eddie didn't give a fuck. He was fine with it. 
but it made me mad. Like it made me really mad. And I was on in the corner waiting for the tag. And when he tagged me in, I kind of lost my shit. And I chopped Jigsaw really hard. And it wasn't even his fault. He had nothing to do with it. But I chopped the fucking shit out of Jigsaw. And then I chopped the shit out of Eric Cannon. And I was hot. Like genuinely hot. So I just yelled, get up, motherfucker, really loud. And it was a tiny little room. And like it was so, so fucking loud. Everybody, like all the crowd, like, oh. And right before the match, or like right before the show, Quack had told me, like told everybody, no swearing, no low blows. I broke that first rule, like, dramatically. Like, it was so fucking loud. It wasn't even subtle. It was insane. Like, everybody was quiet, and I yelled it. And then Eddie immediately hit a low blow after, like, back to back. But he didn't even mean to do it. It just happened. So we broke both their rules back to back. And then when we came to the back, I went up to Quack immediately and apologized. And he was like, yeah, it's fine. It's okay. I understand. Only, I guess it wasn't fine and okay. Because then I kept hearing shit through the... You know, just, hey, Quack's kind of been talking shit about you. Like, in Shakara meetings, like, oh, don't pull a Kevin Steen. He's definitely not coming back anytime soon. And just shit like that. And and then, or other things he would say were a lot, like, more, like, a lot meaner. And the people that would tell me, I just don't think had any reason to lie to me. But I didn't find this out until years later that he had been talking all this, not all this shit, but he had just kind of held a grudge against me. And yet, I had talked to him several times since then. We had worked with each other, and it was never brought up. So when I found out that that was still an issue for him, I thought it was kind of bullshit. And uh, it kind of, you know, made me a little mad, I guess. So I didn't particularly appreciate Chikara for a little while. Like, I thought it was bullshit. Like, oh, you say fucking fuck once, and now you're fucking, you know, the devil there? Whatever. But somehow I ended up going back. Like, that was kind of the basis for the match with Kingston at their Chicago show was that I am the one, I'm the guy who broke those rules and now I was coming back and Kingston was going to fucking fight me. And I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. And um, hopefully, I, hopefully I get to go back eventually. I mean, who knows, though? Maybe they're worried I'll just blurt out some, some more obscenities. So who knows? What'd you think of the stuff with Kingston? That seemed to be something that really captured a lot of people's imagination. Yeah, I mean, I think people, like Eddie's great at promos, and people enjoy my promos, so I think it was a natural fit. And uh, we, you know, we have similar styles, I suppose, where we both kind of brawl and we have the same kind of physique, so it just seems like a, a natural match. And uh, we had never wrestled, like, it's crazy. We've known each other for so long, and we had never been booked against each other this whole time. So I think that was part of why people were really excited about it, is that we had never wrestled each other. This isn't something that had been done in IWA Mid South and had been done in CCW, and now it's a couple of years later, but we already saw it anyway. You know, it was a new fresh match, and I think new fresh matches always get people a little bit excited, especially if it's between guys that they care about already. So I think uh, that had a long way to go. What motivates you? <sighs> I don't know, man. <laughs> That's a really good question. Honestly, I think what motivates me now is my kid because I want him to be proud of me. Like, I I know that I used to want to go to WWE, but obviously, like, I'm talking about, like, four or five years ago, you know, or when I started wrestling in 2000, my dream was to go to WWE. But was that motivation enough? I guess not because I never took the time to make the sacrifices that most guys do which is to work out and diet and, you know, put a lot of effort into the way I look. I never really did that. Like, I've worked out and I've, you know, um, as horrible as I may look, I'm not in terrible shape because I get to do, I do this. Like, I'm fucking, for a guy that's almost 300 pounds, well, I'm not, I'm like 275, but still, I, I can go in a ring. So I'm not necessarily in bad shape. I just don't look too good, which, you know, is a big thing against me. Uh, if I ever wanted to go to WWE. So I, I would say that I've not as silly as it is to some people. I haven't given up on that dream, really. Like, I'd like to go. And maybe one day I'll fucking actually do it and get in shape and get a chance to do it. Who knows? Maybe not. But uh, what motivates me now, I guess, is, like I said, it's for my kid to be proud of me. Just because he likes wrestling and... I think I'm a good dad, but I also want to be something he's proud of. And as good a dad as you are, like, 
he'll never be proud of me for, you know, feeding him well and giving him apple juice when he's thirsty. But he can be proud of me for being the champion, for example. And he is. He's four and a half, and every time I go wrestle, he tells me, don't lose the belt, okay? And I, you know, I take pride in that because I, I see how much he likes wrestling and I see how much he has fun watching it, whether it's me or, or you know, WWE, whatever he watches. And, I, yeah, I want my kid to be proud of me. And in a couple of years when I'm not doing this anymore, he'll be old enough to even understand better what wrestling is and he'll be able to watch my DVDs and hopefully still be proud of me. So I guess that's what motivates me now. How big a uh, a roadblock has your your look been to you? You've mentioned that a lot. It hasn't been a roadblock. There's a there's an interview you cut right after you won the title where you talked about uh, being told early on you can't wear a singlet yeah. in Ring of Honor, you can't wear yeah. a t-shirt in Ring of Honor. Yeah. Like that that seems to be something that you've heard a lot, even if it wasn't a roadblock. It seems to be something that has kind of been drilled into your head. Yeah. But you beat the system. Kinda, I guess. I mean. Um... It depends. Like, to some people, it's fucking ridiculous that I do that. But to me, it's really funny, honestly. Like, I do feel like I beat the system a little bit because I... And I tell this to the people I do... Like, I do wrestling seminars back home where I, I used to. I don't really do them anymore. But I've told them that, like, I am an exception to the rule. In the sense that... Um, like, for example, the guys that I do the seminars with, they all want to go to WWE, too. You know, that's their ultimate dream. But they want to fucking go to Ring of Honor because... You know, Ring of Honor seems to be a good way to get to WWE. So I tell them, like, I'm an exception to the rule. You should work out. You should be in shape. You should look good. Because be an exception, it it, it doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody. And it hasn't worked for everybody. There's a lot of guys that look like me out there. But I am the only one that looks like me that's at the level I'm at now. And I like to think that's because I'm talented and I have a lot to offer besides this. Some other people, some people might disagree, but whatever. Um, but like I said, I'm an exception to that rule, but I don't think it's been a roadblock. I have heard it. Like I've, there's this guy in Quebec, in Quebec City. It's an old wrestling veteran. Uh, if you've read Chris Jericho's book, you probably know who I'm talking about. His name is Sonny Warcloud, and Jer Jericho makes fun of him in his book. He's this guy who portrays a... Uh, uh, an Indian, like a native Indian, and uh, that's his gimmick. It's been his gimmick for since he's wrestled. He's like in, he's almost sixty now, and he's been wrestling since he's been in his twenties. But he never, he was never anything important. Like he, you know, he did. Uh, he wrestled for a lot of territories and stuff like that, but he was never a huge deal. Um, he claims that he was gonna be Tatanka, but then they ultimately chose somebody else for that role because he had drug problems. Uh, but that's like his claim to fame. But he wrestles in Quebec City, and he's he's kind of a respected veteran over there because of how long he's been doing this. And his thing was always that, like you gotta get in shape, you have to be you know in good shape, you have to be work, uh, you have to work out all this stuff. And me, he would always get on my case because I didn't do those things. Yet I was still one of the top guys all the time, and he just didn't understand. And, like, I've worked with him now, and he, like, I don't know, now he softened up on it because he realized that it, whatever I'm doing works for me, even though it's not the norm. And I've heard it from him for so long, like, the t-shirt, that uh, you're not in shape. And then the Ring of Honor thing, like, uh, when I was originally going to be booked in Ring of Honor, Gabe told me, well, you wrestle in a t-shirt, that's the only thing I don't like. I'm like, well, I, I guess I could wrestle in a singlet, because even back then, I wasn't as big as I am now. So, uh, but I wasn't ripped or anything, but, you know. Uh, I was I had no problem wrestling in a singlet. I just didn't think I guess I didn't think I th I think that the t-shirt look just looked better on me. That's all it is. I find the singlet just kind of looked generic and whatever. So, I wrestled in the Ring of Honor a couple shows without my shirt and whatever, and then I could see that it wasn't really working. Like not and I it's stupid. Like I don't think the fact that I was wrestling in a singlet was responsible for it not working. But I had a hard time feeling like myself out there. And now that I, even the way I'm talking about it now, I think it, it was a fucking stupid that I felt that way. Like, it's dumb now that I know better. But I told him, like, hey, can I just wear my fucking shirt? What does it matter? And he's like, yeah, fine, whatever. For the next show. And then before that show, I guess Punk heard of this. And he really had something against a guy wrestling in his t-shirt. And me and Punk weren't friends or anything, but we were, you know, we knew each other. It was fine. 
And I, I guess he took exception to me wrestling in the shirt, so he told me before the show not to wear the shirt. And I had already decided that I wasn't going to wear it, but, you know, when he told me that, I'm like, oh, I definitely shouldn't wear the fucking shirt. And I didn't. And then when I got to the back after my match, uh, I was, I don't know what happened, man. I, I was blown up, so maybe it seemed like it came off really rude, but I wasn't trying to be rude. Punk was looking at me, and I looked at him, and I said, are you happy now? But I was really just trying to kind of kid around with him, but he really took exception to that and reamed me out in front of the whole locker room about how disrespectful I was and this and that. And uh, whatever, I mean, I yelled back a little, and then I realized, what the fuck am I doing? This isn't my place. I'm new here, and he's, you know, he's a top guy. I shouldn't be arguing with him. Plus, Colt was my friend, and him and Punk are friends, so I don't want any of this shit. So I said, okay, you're right, I'm sorry. You know, I apologize, whatever. And that's all it stayed. That's the way it stayed. But then that always, you know, resonated in my head. Like, don't wear the T-shirt, all this shit. That was always such a problem. And yet, and here I am. I uh, When I came back to Ring of Honor, I decided I was going to be completely different. And, you know, I wrestled in the Ring of Honor in a singlet for years. But when I came back, I, I thought to myself, I'll be damned if I'm just fucking one of the guys wrestling in a singlet or in trunks. I'm going to wear my fucking shirt. I'm going to wear shorts. I'm going to look like I'm going in for a street fight every single time I wrestle because this is what I'm here for. I'm here to fucking fight the whole world. I'm not here to wrestle them. So that's my thing, and that's my logic. And it was also part of, you know, Jim Cornette wants, rest, like, the, the you know, Ring of Honor to be represented by athletes and you know, you associate that with guys that are in great shape and the, you know, the nice gear and the, you know, professional looking. And I, I want to be the emphasis of that. I don't want to be that because that's what Jim likes. And I don't want to be something Jim likes. So that's, uh, you know, that was my logic between wrestling. And I took it to a step further. I used to wrestle just in a shirt and a singlet and I fucking put shorts on too now. So, and I still won the Ring of Honor title wearing that when I had been told in the past not to fucking wear a shirt. Well, I did it wearing sh a shirt and shorts, so I guess that says something about fighting the system a little bit, and it worked out for me. So, uh, like I said, I don't think my weight or my look has been an obstacle, really, because I overcame whatever obstacle it could have been. Uh, obviously, now, if I want to go forward and keep going up in wrestling, I have to make uh, decisions, and I have to make sacrifices, and whether I will make them or not is still up in the air, to be honest. I don't know. We'll see where life takes me. What do you love about wrestling? I don't know, man. That's I think you I'm sure you've asked a million wrestlers that and I'm sure they've all said that. Like it's hard to tell. All I know is when I was watching it as a kid something struck like something struck me and it stayed with me. And then um it's always been there, you know, like I've thought about stopping for like a couple times just because it would make my personal life easier, you know, like leaving every weekend and leaving my wife and my kid behind. And, you know, she has a life, too, and she goes to school all the time. And then when I'm gone, she has to take care of our kid by herself. And it's not always easy. And, you know, like I'm not there for that. And sometimes that makes life a little hard. But. You know, getting a real nine to five job would make life easier, but I just, I don't, I can't really do that just because there's something in you when you start wrestling that's very hard to erase. Like, you know, people will make fun. Obviously, a lot of wrestlers take it to a whole other level and they drink and they do drugs and all that shit. And then they become, they become almost like cartoon characters because they're lost in that fucking wrestling world where, you know, like, I'll take Ric Flair as an example. Like, if there's an example of a guy that really can't stop wrestling and should have stopped wrestling but just can't, he's a good example. But for various reasons, he's obviously not an example to follow. But wrestling is like a drug. I mean, I've never done drugs ever. And I barely drink. So I can't... I don't know what it feels like to be addicted to a drug. But I think that... I would imagine it's very close to this. Like, you can't really put your finger on why you need it so bad, but you do. And I've tried to explain that to, like, my wife, for example. Not that she wants me to quit, but she's acknowledged it herself. Like, God, oh, life would be so much easier if we didn't have to live around your wrestling schedule. But she understands. Like, she, you know, there's something in you that, like, I just crave it. You know, it's a passion. 
And I think if you try to explain that to people that haven't had, like, that haven't discovered what their passion is, because a lot of guys, a lot of, not guys, but a lot of people, I think, go through life not fucking knowing what their passion is. Like, they won't, and they might not even ever find out. Like, some people go through life as, like, just, yeah, they're happy, but they, you know, there's nothing they live for. I've lived for wrestling ever since I discovered it. And it's, there's no why. It's just fucking, it resonated in me, and it still does. Um, and I think it always will. And I think that's why a lot of guys can't quit and that should quit, you know, a long time ago, but they're still doing it because it just stays with you. And, uh, you know, you just have to, I guess, I think what's important is to know how to handle that addiction or whatever. Some guys, I don't know, some guys just lose themselves in it too much, but I'm still grounded. I know I have a wife and a kid, and I live for them too. But I also live for wrestling, so I just find a way to balance both. But I don't know why I love it the way I do. I really don't. I don't think anybody will ever put their finger on what it is either. What do you hate about wrestling? Nothing. I mean, I kind of hate not being home with my family, but I know that it's a necessary evil to what I do. Like, for example, PWG, which I love PWG so much. I really have a lot of fun wrestling there, but the fun will last three hours, you know, the time of the show. When I'm traveling, it's, you know, a whole day to fly there and a whole day to fly back, and while I'm gone, you know, the, like the last time I was gone, my, my kid was sick and... My, you know, my mom had to come get him to go to the hospital with him because my wife doesn't have a car and stuff like that. Like, that's shit I should be home for. And it puts stress on my life and on her, too, you know, because I'm calling her and she's fucking flipping out. And she's like, you know, I'm dealing with this and you're not here. But she understands that I need those three hours. You know what I mean? And obviously, I make money, too, now. That's how I, I make a living and that's how I support us. So she understands it's necessary as well. But... Um, you know, that's probably the closest part of what I hate is that sometimes I'm not there when they need me. Uh, but that'd be about it, man. I don't know. We've talked about what you love about wrestling. We've talked about what you don't love so much about wrestling. Has there been a moment or, or even a couple of moments that summed up the whole journey for you? That I, I always call it the moment that I could I could live in this moment forever. That this is this is what I've worked for. This is the climax. No, you know why? Because I don't think I've had that moment yet. Like I don't think I'm done creating moments in wrestling. Like uh, there's a lot of moments I look back fondly on from my IWS debut to the CZW match to my PWG debut to like winning the PWG belt because that was a big deal too to winning the Ring of Honor belt to coming back in New York City when I said fuck Ring of Honor those, like those are all moments to like or unmasking in PWG unmasking as Super Dragon like that first year I was there just so many moments that are so special or like I don't know taking my son when he was like five months old in, into the PWG ring because something happened and we needed a good way to close off the show and I figured, fuck it, I'll bring my kid in the ring. Those are just memories and moments that I, you know, I'll always look back fondly, but that moment you're talking about, I don't think I've had it yet because, like I said, I don't think I'm done creating it, like, moments and people have asked me, um, like, I've gotten the question so many times on Twitter, what's the best moment in wrestling, what's your best moment in your career? And I always answer, I haven't had it yet because I don't think this... Like, winning, winning the Ring of Honor World title is the highest accomplishment I've had so far, along with the PWG title, and now I'm, like, champion in both. And uh, that means a lot to me, because those are two companies that I've poured my heart and soul into. So being the champion for both at the same time means I'm doing something good. And it means that all the stuff I've done so far, it's paying off, you know? I'm, I'm happy, and it's fun, and my kid's proud of it. My kid, I bring the belts home, and my kid's really proud of me. But... I really don't think this is high, as high as it gets for me. I think that's just a new beginning, and now I have to find a way to just keep getting better or keep going higher until eventually it's... I'll Like, I feel like when it's time for me to stop, I'll know. And I will. Uh, 
I'll throw some names out sure. and just give me the, the first thought that comes to your mind or a story if something comes or just your impressions of them. Uh, Super Dragon. Um, I wouldn't like I wouldn't have gotten as far as I, I have without him and I wouldn't have been who I am without him in the sense that that feud that I had with him shaped the Kevin Steen that's out there now. Like I wasn't the way I am now back then as a wrestler. Like he opened a whole new world to me of I guess the hard hitting and just more raw style of pro wrestling that I hadn't really been accustomed to before. He opened that up for me and that whole feud shaped me into a lot of what I am now. So and he's also a great friend probably I have a brother, like I have a, a real life brother but I'm not super close with him. I, I think Super Dragon's probably the closest thing I'll ever have to, like, a brother. You know, even though we're not related, I'm probably closer to him than I am to my own brother. Excalibur. <laughs> He's a great dude. And, again, him being part of another PWG, that company did so much for me that I feel like he's responsible for a lot of it. And he's helped me through, like so many in so many ways throughout my career, from helping me design T-shirts or DVD covers to... Um, to writing a letter as part of Pro Wrestling Guerrilla for to help get my visa, my work visa for the states. To listening about, you know, how hard it was when my son was diagnosed with autism. Like he's a friend and he's there for me and he's done so much for me and I can't. I have nothing bad to say about him. I actually really wish he'd get back in the ring and now Dragon's back off uh, like for a while because of his injury again and who knows if he'll come back. But if he does come back, I. I still have that little a bit of a dream, I guess, to redo me and Generico against Super Dragon Excalibur that we did at a Cage of Death, I don't even remember the number, in 2004, and I'd love to do it one more time because Excalibur has pretty much called it quits now, but I, I wish he'd come back for that one match. I've told him that a lot, but I don't think it's going to happen. Joey Ryan. Um, I like Joey. I don't... I'm not particularly a big fan of his in-ring stuff, but I don't think he's bad. I just not really my style and um i don't know he's a good guy and i think uh a lot of people like what he does which is great it's not really my cup of tea though i guess but it doesn't mean it's bad um that's about it again he's part of their pwg so just for that i feel like i owe him a lot just because of how much the promotion helped me davy richards um davy's a good guy that um Needs to think maybe a bit more before he says some of the stuff he says and does some of the things he does. Um, he's my friend. I, I don't I have no hard feelings towards him at all. Young Bucks. They're the best. The fucking best. They're the best team. Some of my best opponents. Some of the most entertaining guys in the ring. Any company is lucky to have them, and any company who chooses not to use them is a little bit dumb, in my opinion. And uh, they're really great guys, too. So, I'm, I really love the Bucks. Tyler Black. Uh, and again, like, I'm, I'm, I have so many guys I like. I feel it's being redundant, but I, I really love Tyler, and he's doing really well for himself, and I don't think anybody expected any different from him. I mean, I remember when he started Ring of Honor, and Jimmy Jacobs was telling people this guy will be world champion real soon and he's some special. I didn't see it until eventually I fucking it slapped me in the face, you know? Like, oh shit, he is something special and everybody's seeing it now. He's doing really well and I think he's got a really bright future. Roderick Strong. Bro, you don't understand. No, I love Roddy and I do a pretty good impersonation of him, which makes me like him even more. He's a bit... Uh, I'm going to say, I, I guess not anymore, but I, I think he used to be a little bit hard to work with. Not because he's a bad wrestler. He's a great wrestler, but I think he has a certain way of doing things, and I don't think he wants to derive from that too much for anybody. So I think you have to kind of learn to work with him. But I think once you've, know, you've learned how to work with him, it's, it's, it's a good time. And I think he's probably one of the hardest working wrestlers like anywhere like every show this guy gives it his all and he's like i've never seen him take it easy you know what i mean like he'll give it his all and it might not always be the best match on the show or it might always not it might not always be you know a, a great match but fuck he'll give it all every time i know that briscoes <sighs> again they're fucking great dudes great wrestlers and uh 
if there's anybody that probably should be millionaires in wrestling and that aren't, I think they'd probably be number one and two. Like, they're those dudes, I don't understand why they're not on TV every Monday and doing their thing. They're so genuinely entertaining. Like, none of what they do is forced. None of what they do is set up. This is just those guys, and they're a fucking blast in and out of the ring. So uh, hopefully they'll do really well for themselves. Jim Cornette. Um, I think Jim should retire. I tell him that all the time on TV. It's not any secret to anybody, but I... Uh, this is the way I feel. Cole Cabana. Fuck. Uh, another one of my brothers. I love Colt, and uh, I guess he'd be number three on the list of guys that should be millionaires but aren't. But he does so good for himself that who gives a shit if he's not in WWE? Like, he's probably the most successful independent wrestler there is out there, and it's all self-made, which is amazing. He's made, you know, contacts and he's used those contacts and he's, he's, you know, promoted himself in such a way that he's, he's as close to a household name as any independent wrestler will ever be. And he did it all by himself. And like, there's the podcast and like now he's involved with $5 wrestling. It's just all that stuff. Like I feel like, and he's doing, you know, the stand up and all that stuff is, uh, Colt's just really good at making what he's doing interesting. And uh, I think that's a strength, and I don't. I think the sky's the limit for him. Steve Carino. Uh, probably the man that's helped me the most in wrestling of anybody I've ever met. Um, like PCO kind of took me under his wing uh, earlier in my career, but Steve uh, definitely did that a lot for me too. And he's helped me go to Japan. Like he brought me to Japan, and he like put his name on the line for me for that time. And he came back to Ring of Honor and was okay just being my, my, like he was there to help me. And I think for a veteran of his uh, stature and for a veteran, like a guy that has as much experience as he does and has accomplished as much as he has, to be able to do that, I don't think it'd be everybody who'd be willing to do that. And I really appreciate it. And um, I've learned so much from him. And just in and out of the ring, like I've learned how to be a better wrestler and I've learned how to be like a good father as like, while still being a pro wrestler because he's a great dad to a son and I think that's what I like the most about him honestly but he's also one of my idols like when I was younger I mentioned how much I liked Shawn Michaels earlier Shawn Michaels, Steve Austin and later when I discovered ECW Steve Carino were my idols so to get to work with them as much as I have and to get to be his friend is uh, really something I appreciate a lot El Generico he's the best uh, wrestler in the world I think it's not a secret anymore, and um, I think nothing will stop him. And I really hope I get to wrestle him many more times uh, for many more years, but I don't think that's going to happen because I honestly believe that sooner than later he's going to get signed and be a fucking huge deal in wrestling because nobody wrestles like him, and he's got a natural charisma that people haven't even seen yet that I'm sure will be discovered soon enough. Kevin Steen. I'm just a guy who loves to wrestle and um, is lucky enough to get to do it a lot. I, and I'm a dad and I'm a husband and uh, that's pretty much the best way to sum me up. I'm a guy who loves wrestling and has a great family. Any regrets? I regret not getting in shape. I wish I had done it, and I still wish to this day that I would. But I don't. Um, you could call me lazy. Maybe I am. I don't think I am. I think, I don't know, or maybe I'm just making excuses. That's some shit, like deeper shit that I'm willing to go into now, but I'm sure there's a reason why I've gotten in shape. And ultimately, I guess it is laziness, but I'm sure something brings that laziness upon me. Who knows? All I know is that I've done well for myself the way I am now. And uh, hopefully I'll keep doing well for myself. And uh, if I don't make the sacrifice I need to, do, to make in order to get higher than I am now, well, that'll be my own fault. Nobody else's. 
but I'm happy the way I am, so we'll see what happens. Would you say you have a goal to get higher than you are now, or would you say you have, what would you say is your goal? My goal is, uh, like, if I could have a perfect life, it would be to make a good living off wrestling and be able to, you know, like, because I want to provide for my kid and my wife. I don't want there to be stress. And now there is stress. Like, I live off wrestling now, and my wife is still in school, so she's not contributing financially just yet. So the financial burden of my family is on me. And I, we're doing fine, but we're not doing great. And I want to do great. Like, I don't want it to be stressful sometimes. And sometimes it is stressful. Like, the bills come in faster than the fucking my bookings come in. I'm like, oh, shit, what are you going to do about this one? And most of the time, we end up just fine. Like, we, it works out. You know, I catch a booking or I, I manage to sell merch and everything is fine. But that stress that's there, I don't want it anymore. Not even for me. I don't want it for her. Because it's not fair to her because... I've been wrestling since the moment we met, and I've been going away on weekends since the moment we met, and she's put up with that. And then she had our kid, and I've been gone a lot in times where she would have needed me, and she has put up with that too. So I feel like the least I owe her is to make sure that there's no financial stress and that she can just be happy and worry-free because whether, you know, everybody knows that the one, the biggest worry in life is money so I don't want her to worry about any of this and while I'm doing pretty good now I I still worry about money and I'd love to get to a point where I don't have to worry about money she doesn't have to worry about money and my kid gets whatever he needs and that's about it that's my goal logically WWE is the only way to really accomplish that so that goes back to me having to make sacrifices that I have yet to make so we'll see uh, we'll see what happens but my ultimate goal it's not necessarily to be in WWE it's to make a good living and make my family happy well we've gotten a lot of insight into you into what drives you personally and professionally and we thank you for sitting down with us thanks guys don't give up don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Fight forever. And ever. And ever. And ever. And ever.